with us is we are um, dealing with some technical issues, but I think we're all uh, all on and ready to go. It's good to see everyone. I'm going to open the meeting with some just brief participation notes. Uh, please note that the meeting is being recorded. Um, it's open to the public with options for public participation. This meeting is also being live streamed and a recording of the meeting will be available on the MUS website. We will begin the meeting once all board members are here, of which I believe all are here. So Amy, if you could uh, take the roll call. I'd be happy to Chair Lozar, thank you. Uh, we'll start with you, please. Uh, Regent Lozar. Here. Thank you. Regent Nicetoon. Here. Thank you. Regent Sheehy. Here. Thank you. You sound great. Uh, Regent Sexton. Here. Thank you. Regent Rogers. Here. Thank you. Regent Dombrowski. Here. Thank you. Regent Tuss. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Christian. Here. Thank you. Uh, Governor Bullock is joined today. His representative is Ms. McCall Flynn. McCall, are you with us? I am. Thanks, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. And uh, Superintendent Elsie Arnston will be joining us shortly this morning or afternoon. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Amy. I think we, we have everyone present. It's, uh, it's hard to believe how fast the last uh, few weeks have gone since uh, we were here meeting last at our September meeting. And it's also hard to believe that our, our campuses are now at, at or near their final days of their classes uh, for the fall semester. And I just wanted to mention on, on, half, on behalf of the entire board, uh, I wanna thank our students, the faculty, uh, the staff for making the fall semester uh, 2020 possible during these really extraordinary and uh, challenging times. And I, I also wanna thank the Healthy Fall Task Force for your efforts in laying out uh, the plan uh, to make this semester a reality for all of our students in our campus community. And it, it hasn't been easy, um, but I, I feel that we have succeeded in our goal of allowing our students to pursue their academic uh, goals on campus. And for that, we really share our deepest gratitude to our students and the employees across the system and to our partners in our campus communities that have supported the continuing education of, the, of our MUS students. Uh, I wanna just take a quick walk through our agenda uh, over the next couple of days. Commissioner Christian will be updating us on the system's uh, COVID response. And we'll talk about the launch about the launch of the Apply Montana Central Application Tool and what's next on the admissions and the enrollment front. And then after the break, we're gonna dive into the agenda uh, from the budget admin and audit committee, including a review of the governor's budget, which was released on Monday. Um, and then moving into Friday, we'll open the Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee followed by the two-year education and community college committees, um, which will also include an, an action item on the Bitter Valley Community College District, followed by a look at the, the draft of the final report from the Montana University System two-year uh, commission, legislative commission. But before we uh, really dive in, I just have a, a few quick housekeeping items and I will, I'll ask Amy to address some of the technical components associated, associated with today's meeting. So Amy, if you could do that. My pleasure, thank you, Chair Lozar. Good afternoon, everyone. And just a quick shout out of thanks to the campus Zoom Room coordinators for their hard work in creating an on-campus physical space for meeting participants. Please note that the board members will be displayed throughout the entirety of the meeting. And as we navigate through committees and items, if you're a presenter, you'll be prompted to step forward either to your Zoom room podium and video and audio prompts will be sent in accordance with the agenda and schedule of events um, to assist with those prompts. Once your presentation is finished, you'll be prompted to turn your camera off. A friendly reminder that the Zoom system will alert you when your line is muted or unmuted, if your video should be turned on or off, and if your raised hand has been acknowledged. For those of you joining from an individual device and not a Zoom room, if at any point you need to step away from the meeting, please do not exit the meeting, but simply ensure you're muted and turn your video off. Should your audio or video start to break up or cause issues, please, um, you'll be prompted to turn it off and we'll simply restart those components for you. 
For those who are joined via a campus Zoom room, please do stay logged on for the entirety of today's meeting. We will mute the line uh, during breaks and cameras will be turned off during that time. If you wish to, wish to ask a question or make a comment during the meeting, please use the raise your hand feature. If joining online, this feature is found on the participant panel near the bottom of your screen. If you're joining by phone, simply dial star nine, that's the asterisk followed by the numeral nine to raise your hand. Once your hand is raised, please wait to be called on. We will acknowledge your request as soon as we can. Be prepared to unmute yourself. A time is scheduled, public comment and additional instructions will come later on. Written public comment can be sent to me, Amy Unsworth at aunsworth at montana.edu. If you run into any technical issues at any point, please email Jared Smith at jsmith at montana.edu for assistance. Jared is on standby to assist. Thanks again and back to you, Regent Lozar. Uh, thank you, Amy. And thanks again for getting all the, the technical aspects set up for uh, today and tomorrow's meeting. Uh, we'll, we'll proceed to uh, the approval of the minutes. Uh, board members in front of you, you'll see September 16, 2020 board meeting minutes and I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So sure, move, Lazar, I move to approve. Uh, moved by Regent Dombrowski. Is there any discussion or corrections from members of the board? Is there any discussion or corrections from the campuses? And if so, please use the raise your hand feature or dial star nine if joining by phone. Are there any discussions or corrections from the campuses? Is there any public comment? If so, please use the raise your hand feature or dial star nine if you're joining by phone. Is there any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. All right, motion passes and the meeting minutes have been approved. Um, of course, the November meeting uh, <clears throat> for this year, we were supposed to be on the University of Mon Montana campus. And um, I think under other circumstances, we would be excited to be um, uh, in Missoula today. Um, so we're gonna start our, our meeting with a, a welcome by uh, University of Montana President, Seth Bodner. He'll be highlighting how the University of Montana faculty and researchers are working beyond their campus borders to help our state meet the challenges of the pandemic. Uh, I will hand it off to you, President Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a quick check. I'm assuming everyone can, can hear me okay. I always wanna just double check. Our, all right, I'm seeing thumbs up. So uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share a few words as we close out uh, really what's, what's been a, a critical semester here at U of M. Uh, like our colleagues across the Montana University system, we join you today, both proud of the really Herculean efforts of the last several months, uh, and also prepared to shape a successful winter and spring. Uh, and, I, and on behalf of the, the University of Montana family, I wanna thank all of my colleagues across the state, and of course, uh, uh, in the commissioner's office uh, for their hard work. I wanna echo uh, Chair Lozar's comments uh, to say that we do miss you here in Missoula. It, uh, the sun is shining here in, in Missoula and uh, it would be a glorious week uh, to have the brawl of the wild here in uh, Washington Grizzly Stadium. So we, uh, we absolutely miss having you here with us and, uh, and we look forward to, uh, to days when we can be together in, in person again. Um, you know, but just as the, as the Board of Regents has had to adjust during this, this pandemic, there's really, as, as Chair Lozar uh, noted, there's been no aspect of our instruction or our operations here at UM that hasn't been impacted by the realities of, of COVID-19. Uh, this has clearly been a taxing time for all of us. Uh, frankly, there's never been a more challenging season in my life as a leader. Um, there's simply no playbook for running a university in the midst of a pandemic. But, but while this has been, yes, the most challenging time of, of my career, it's also been the most inspiring as well. Uh, over the past nine months, I've been humbled uh, and amazed by the way our faculty, our staff, our students have risen to the challenge of this pandemic. 
Uh, you know, and, and in doing so, the, the UM family has drawn upon a, a deep reservoir of what's best in us, our creativity, our cooperation, our resilience, uh, and especially an abiding commitment to our student success. And I, I frankly couldn't be more honored to be part of this team. If you go to the next page, Amy, uh, you know, just to, uh, I want to just uh, reiterate the, the the work of this semester. Um, you know, we've had one overarching goal throughout this pandemic, and that has been, as Chair Larzar mentioned, to ensure that our students can keep on learning safely. Uh, and last spring, our campus preparedness and response group, which is comprised of administration, faculty, staff, and students, they began meeting regularly to identify challenges and, and propose solutions to ensure that that learning could happen. Uh, last spring, as you know, we rapidly transitioned more than 4,000 courses to a remote delivery format. Uh, and then we quickly shifted gears to uh, provide, provide a robust array of offerings during the summer. Uh, and in fact, we saw our summer enrollment increase this year uh, for the third straight year. In fact, summer enrollment this year was, uh, was over 30% higher than it was in 2017. Um, and, you know, without much of a breather, we, uh, and frankly, in parallel, we were getting ready for a return to in-person learning for the fall. And as the uh, semester approached, our teams kicked into high gear. Our faculty tirelessly adjusted their courses uh, to enable in-person learning, but while also making sure we were flexible enough for students who needed to be remote uh, for personal reasons or, or due to quarantine or isolation needs. Uh, at the same time, our facilities team uh, worked to reconfigure hundreds of classrooms across campus to enable safe social distancing. We also uh, constructed more than a dozen outdoor classrooms here on our campus that were utilized from sunrise to sunset. Uh, the smoke put a bit of a damper on that uh, in the fall, but, uh, but great utilization of those classrooms. Our IT team, uh, massive efforts to upgrade our infrastructure to meet the demands of hybrid learning model. UM housing and dining staff revamped their entire operations while campus police and our public health faculty worked really hard to, to set up quarantine and isolation procedures. UM transportation established new guidelines to move students and community members around, uh, around campus. Whereas the athletics revamped their protocols. Uh, Curry Health, uh, our Curry Health Center stepped up uh, to provide point of care testing for COVID-19 and and our genomics core began a partnership with DPHHS to process COVID-19 cases uh, tests. Uh, and through our Grizz Health initiative, our students also stepped up as leaders. They served as volunteers on the front lines of our campus education, contact tracing, and, and mitigation efforts. And, and I list these um, because I want to emphasize that it really was the entire UM family that came together to ensure that our students could continue learning during this pandemic. And it's that collective commitment, that this showing up for students, uh, that, that I think helps explain why, even in the midst of a pandemic, we uh, have seen our retention and persistence increase. We saw our first year retention rate this year six percentage points higher than it was two years ago. And, and we, saw, we saw record graduate enrollment this year. Um, huge credit uh, to, to the team on this campus. And, and I want to reiterate what I said as I started, that there are colleagues across the state uh, could tell similar stories. And I want to both thank uh, my colleagues for their partnership uh, and also, of course, the the, whole, the entire OG team, Commissioner Christian and uh, and, and especially uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Tessman with the, with the Healthy Fall Task Force. I just can't speak enough about the spirit of partnership and collaboration that has made this semester, you know, we're not there yet uh, to the end, but close, uh, but made this semester a success, not just here at UM, but across the system. Of course, we're no mean, by no means out of the woods. That vigilance has to continue. Our COVID-19 response team, our CRT, continues to meet daily. And uh, we're going to maintain a, a laser-like focus on the, on the pandemic and, and how we adapt. Uh, challenges will emerge, uh, but we will continue to adapt. And, and I tell you, I couldn't be uh, more grateful to be part of a Montana University system team that's so committed to our student success. Um, you know, but, but even as we deal with this pandemic, we're continuing to look out over the horizon. Uh, and we've made a lot of progress here this year on a lot of fronts. And I want to just give you a, a few highlights uh, of some of the progress that's happened here at the university over the course of the past year amidst the pandemic. And, and Amy, if you go to the next slide, I, I'd first highlight uh, research. It's been a banner year for research and, and scholarship at the University of Montana. For the first year in our institution's history, we exceeded $100 million in research expenditures. And in fact, our expenditures 
this past year were more than double what they were just six years ago, or almost double, excuse me. Uh, uh, tremendous growth in research. Uh, and this not only creates new knowledge, it, it creates new jobs, entire new businesses, uh, and, and meaningful statewide impact. And examples of that impact abound. Uh, you'll hear later from Vice President Wittenberg about uh, uh, Dr. Kelsey Jensko, pictured there in the uh, middle right. Uh, he leads our, our, uh, our climate office here at U of M, and, and he was recently awarded a $21 million grant to install weather stations for monitoring snowpack and soil moisture in the upper Missouri River Basin, one of our nation's most critical headwaters. Or Dr. Monica Serban, pictured in the lower left there. She's a professor and researcher in our Department of Biomedical and Pharmaceutical Sciences. Earlier this year, she and her team received a $2.4 million grant from the Office of Naval Research to explore new engineered systems to prevent engineered systems to prevent hearing loss among U.S. sailors and Marines. Um, and I love her creativity. Uh, because later this later that year, she uh, she and her children, as I understand it, were wrestling to to apply uh, eardrops to their family dog for an ear infection. And another idea pops into her head, uh, which led her and her team to uh, to develop a single application antibiotic to treat outer ear infections, a problem estimated to affect about 10% of people in their lifetimes with tremendous multi-million dollar associated health costs annually. And then she got a million and a half dollar grant from the NIH to continue that development. Or Dr. Jay Evans, who uh, again, Vice President Wittenberg will mention, he and his Center for Translational Medicine just recently received the largest grant in the history of the University of Montana, $33.4 million. Uh, from the NIH for the development and trials of opioid vaccines. Uh, and as you may know, earlier this year, uh, Dr. Evans and his team received multiple grants from the NIH for their work on a COVID-19 vaccine. And, and frankly, that's one of the big reasons why the University of Montana was named this August to a list of the top 10 universities solving the coronavirus pandemic, joining schools like Harvard and Oxford in, in battling the impacts of this virus. And I want to just say, you know, the, the, the research that happens here, it's, it's tremendous societal impacts, but it also is, is uh, uh, incredibly important for our students. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons we continue to see our students succeed in, uh, in the pursuit of uh, prestigious scholarships. Uh, we continue a great tradition of, of, of uh, Udall scholars at the University of Montana this year, uh, receiving a Udall scholarship, and, and actually six UM students and grads receive the, the prestigious Fulbright Scholarship. Uh, and our success rate in pursuing these uh, is above the national average and, and actually higher than, than Ivy League institutions um, in, in some cases. So really excited about the research impact here. Um, but that, that impact, if you go to the next slide, extends beyond just this university. You know, one of our priorities for action here at U of M is to partner with PLACE. And uh, as we face the community-wide challenge of COVID-19 over the past year, that partnership's never been more important. You'll hear about some of these uh, efforts later, um, but, but really it's been across disciplines that we've seen our faculty and students step up to meet the needs of our community during this tumultuous time. And in fact, just prior to the pandemic's arrival, uh, pretty, pretty prescient, uh, frankly, UM and uh, the Missoula City County Health Department created a formal academic health department. Uh, unique partnership, one of only 11 in the entire country but uh, having that in place has, has frankly ensured that our community's pandemic response has been informed while, you know, by our faculty's expertise. And it's also provided once in a lifetime hands-on learning uh, experience for our students. Uh, and, and in fact, tomorrow, this body will consider the, the naming of our Skaggs Institute for Health Innovation, uh, which, which, we've, uh, which, we've, which we're launching and aim to launch to be a statewide hub for education, research, and telehealth and precision medicine. Uh, we're going to, this, the, our, our faculty members are, are partnering with local, prayer, pr local providers to provide access both to care in remote pockets of Montana, but also to the emerging field of, uh, of pharmacogenetics. It's a really exciting impact. Um, but it's not just in the realm of health and medicine where this partnership matters. Uh, in fact, our history students, you can see a picture in the upper left. That's, uh, that's a picture of, of them working with community members to document and archive the experiences, challenges, successes, uh, failures in some parts of frontline of frontline workers and businesses during the early days of the pandemic, and and uh, it's it's incredibly important uh, to to document these experiences to ensure that 
the future generations learn from what we've uh, what we've seen over the past year. And uh, just as we over the past year have turned to uh, to, to archive research on uh, on previous health crises, and also the SCD upper right, uh, the play zombie thoughts, uh, which the Montana rep put on in a, in a virtual interactive format uh, for thousands of Montana's K through 12 students this year. Really, the goal being helping them both to understand and acknowledge and, and help address some of the, the feelings of anxiety that many of us uh, are, are experiencing uh, over the course of this pandemic. If you go to the next page, uh, these efforts extend to the business community. Uh, our, uh, our Accelerate Montana initiative here at, at U of M launched a program together with Missoula Economic Partnership earlier this year called the Business Emergency Assistance Recovery, or BEAR, program. Uh, and really, it was intended to help uh, local businesses navigate that complicated portfolio of, uh, of economic economic development and relief programs available during the uh, during the pandemic. I mean, clearly, small business owners in Montana are the lifeblood of our economy, and uh, it's so important to support their work. Uh, and of course, if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll you'll see that uh, uh, that impact is is of course focused on that next generation of Grizzlies. Uh, if you were to be with us here in Missoula this week, you would uh, drive past the stunning new Missoula Public Library, and uh, you'd see on the first floor of that library the Living Lab. Uh, this is a, a unique space that's that's a result of an ongoing partnership between UM and the Missoula Public Library. The goal is really to provide students of all ages the opportunity to engage in UM research. Uh, it, it's really the, uh, uh, and you can see in the picture here, uh, the Living Lab's distribution of, uh, of brown bag full of science activities for children uh, during the pandemic have access to engaging uh, educational opportunities. Uh, and similarly, our, our, uh, our spectrum discovery area, which serves nearly 200,000 young learners annually, is also now located in the Missoula Public Library. And they recently received a, a $671,000 award to conduct hands-on STEM education across Montana. So really exciting efforts looking at that next generation. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, uh, I think it's important to highlight also um, the work that we're doing uh, around the society that, that these young grizzlies will enter. And I'm really excited to, and, and proud of the impact that uh, the UM family um, has had as, as we as a nation reckon with, with issues of, of equity and social justice. Early this year, we've enrolled hundreds of, of students and community members in anti-bias courses, uh, while the UM Institute for Humanities is, is, uh, is also providing ways for the community to, to understand and, and, and discuss some of the most pressing social justice uh, issues and, and challenges. And we're proud, of course, of our uh, four MUS teaching scholars, Andrew King-Reese, Monty Mills, Kate Braco, and uh, Selena Beaumont-Hill who are committed through this program to, ex to advancing equity-minded pedagogies on UM's campus. And uh, even though we couldn't do it in person, we, we continued with our 15th annual uh, diversity symposium called Diverse U. Uh, UM students and, and the public took part in, in you know, tough at times, really important conversations led by leaders both here in Missoula and across the country. Um, and I think this is really important right now. Um, because so, this showcased the, the continued important role that, that this university and, and all public institute, institutions play in fostering respectful civil discourse around topics that matter. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I just want to highlight that that partnership that we're talking about here goes both ways. Um, you know, frankly, the broader uh, UM community has seen the impact of this institution, and uh, they've stepped up to help in meaningful ways. Uh, Campaign Montana. Our fundraising campaign was launched in 2013 with uh, a really ambitious goal of raising $320 million over the next seven years. Uh, we went public with that campaign in the fall of 2018. We increased that goal. We said we want to go for $400 million. Um, but in the background, we said, look, at U of M, we're, uh, we're not content with just hitting goals. Uh, we want to go for 110% of that goal. So we had a, uh, a quiet goal of $440 million. Uh, and I'm thrilled to report that uh, that even amidst the pandemic and those challenges that were created, we closed the campaign this year and exceeded our stretch goal of, uh, of 440. We raised over $450 million. It's the largest and most impactful development effort in our state's history. 
Uh, donors from all 50 states contributed nearly 100,000 individual gifts to Campaign Montana. More than 16,000 first-time donors uh, pledged their support to U of M. And uh, we're, we're just tremendously grateful for this vote of confidence in this institution uh, and in our students. But if you go to the next page, I, I want to emphasize that, uh, that we're, not, we're never satisfied with where we are. Uh, and frankly, in times of crisis, I think it's more important than ever that, that we be rigorously self-reflective and uh, willing to evolve and, and best serve our community, state, and uh, in our broader society. And that's just what we're doing. And if you go to the next page, uh, a, a, a very visible expression of that is the renewal of physical space here on campus. Um, uh, we've launched a, a pretty substantial overhaul of our student-facing infrastructure here at U of M. Uh, we've shared with this body uh, the importance of, uh, of a strategic restructuring of our debt that we undertook last year, uh, which, which enabled us to secure capital needed to make long overdue improvements uh, to some of UM's uh, most iconic landmarks. And I want to invite everybody to watch the virtual tour. It's a short video narrated uh, by, by Paul Lasseter, our Vice President for Operations and Finance, who who now thinks he has a future in Ken Burns documentaries, I think, but uh, he, did a, he did a really good job with that narration. Um, but you know, you'll see for the first time in a generation, we refurbished the oval centerpiece of our campus. We upgraded Gary Lecture Hall, our largest shared learning space. We upgraded Panzer Revenal, Re residence hall, pictured in the upper left there. Opened the new Rise and Rooted coffee shop and restaurants where, restaurant where students can connect and, and physical spaces that nourish their learning experience. And as we look forward to that next phase of renewal, we're also uh, looking forward and excited about the state partnership. Um, and that partnership, I think first and foremost, includes the, the priority new construction project on the, uh, on the LR, LRBP, uh, which is a new forestry conservation and, and lab sciences facility. You know, the WA Frankie College of Forestry and Conservation here at UN is, is world renowned. Uh, it's home in fact, to the nation's number one wildlife biology program. But, uh, as we're preparing that next generation of foresters, wildlife managers, biologists, climate change experts, we're doing so in a building that's over 100 years old. Uh, in fact, our forestry students and faculty are spread out amongst 11 other buildings as the current facility doesn't uh, meet the needs of, uh, of this growing college. We're also at the same time in critical need of new instructional labs to keep pace with the demand for biology, chemistry, and other science lab offerings here at U of M. Uh, and so this building's incredibly important. And, and we're also excited as we think about the concept of this building um, that, uh, that we aim to uh, construct it using uh, Montana-made cross-laminated timber. Um, it's really a, a, an expression of our commitment to sustainability, both of the environment and to Montana industry. Um, and uh, we're really excited about this and, and, and we're hopeful for a sizable investment from the state uh, but, but one that, that also uh, enables us to, to secure sizable private funds uh, to construct what we hope will be a, uh, not just a, a, a fantastic and fitting home for this world-renowned college uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a lab space that, that meets our student needs, but also a landmark facility uh, that showcases our state's ability to produce an emerging building material that, uh, that is uh, incredibly environmentally friendly. And we're excited to work with the commissioner's office in this body to advocate for that important investment. Um, if you go to the next page, I want to highlight just a few, uh, a few examples of the fact that, yes, physical space matters, uh, but so does innovation and renewal in our student programs. And over the past year, we've launched a number of interdisciplinary academic and, and co-curricular opportunities, many of which this body's heard about. Our interactive media and game design concentration our environment and sustainability degree, an innovation certificate that can be embedded into any major, a new hunting for sustainability course that uh, we believe will attract learners from across the country, as well as an American Indian Policy Institute that will provide for hands-on learning and, and valuable tribal community partnerships. And it's really these interdisciplinary and applied programs that embody the, the reality that, that our greatest challenges and opportunities uh, frankly, lay at the intersection of disciplines. Um, and, uh, and that's an important thing for us to recognize uh, for our students' uh, holistic growth as learners. Um, we also, this year, on the next page, just want to highlight our, our launching a program we're calling Elevate You. 
uh, which is in recognition that uh, that our state industry leaders are looking for, yes, well-rounded uh, uh, students with those foundational competencies of critical thinking, innovation, problem solving, but also equipped with those tangible skills and experiential learning opportunities that enable them to succeed on day one. And uh, Elevate U is a program that's gonna complement this, uh, this robust interdisciplinary foundation and, and intentionally um, and systematically uh, provide opportunities for our students to, uh, to get those on the job experience and skills that, uh, that they need to thrive on day one in a competitive job market. Uh, if you move to the next page, um, I wanna highlight a, something we're really, we're really excited about here, which is our Sea Change Initiative. Um, we've seen great progress here uh, in helping to keep our young Grizzlies, especially young women, engaged and empowered and, and, and helping them, uh, helping to accelerate them into lives and careers and impact. Uh, and I'm proud to, to share that we've hired Twyla Old Coyote as the first director of our Sea Change Initiative. Uh, and our inaugural cohort of Sea Change undergraduate students is finishing up a semester of coursework and soon we'll be launching, launching a mentorship program for middle and high school students this spring. Uh, and in fact, just last week in partnership with uh, UM's Women Lead, Women's Leadership Initiative, uh, the Sea Change Initiative hosted a virtual conference for over 70 young women uh, dedicated to living empowered lives and pursuing careers of impact. Uh, so really excited and, and proud of the progress that this team has made on this campus and, uh, and tackling important issues. Um, and, and, and finishing up, I shared earlier, if you go to the next page, uh, how excited we are about the progress we've made here at U of M on retention and persistence, uh, increasing our, our retention rate, six full percentage points since the fall of, uh, of 2018. We're excited about, but, but we, we know and want, we know we can and, and, and we will do better. Uh, and we're excited to, to partner uh, with our colleagues at Ochi. Uh, through a, a project called uh, Montana 10 that you've heard quite a bit about. Um, and uh, here, on, here on the UM campus under the leadership of Amy Capalupo, Montana 10 scholars have been thriving. And I know that's also true on the Helena College campus under the leadership of uh, Ann Wilcoxon. And uh, I'm really excited about the tremendous impact that this program will have. I know you're gonna hear later uh, from Christine Miller, OG's Director of Student Affairs and Student Engagement about Montana 10. And we're, we're grateful for for Christine uh, and the entire uh, OG team for their leadership and partnership uh, on this important, important initiative. Uh, and, and finally, you know, as I mentioned, in times of uh, of crisis, um, we have to be rigorously self-reflective and willing to evolve. Um, and even though we've been uh, uh, working to deal with the challenges of today and the 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 the, the craziness of a pandemic. Uh, we're intentionally focusing on the UM of tomorrow. Um, and, and earlier this year, we, uh, we launched a university design team to, uh, to consider what a flagship of the future should look like. Uh, that team's been busy articulating our vision, a set of design principles that really will serve as a lens through which uh, we'll continually assess our efforts. Our campus is engaging with, uh, with these principles. Um, and soon this team uh, will, will propose some potential strategic initiatives tangible actions that, that we may undertake as a university to move toward uh, that, that vision of, of being a flagship of the future. And, 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 and I'm excited because the ideas and work that this team's surfacing are, are really challenging us to be innovative, to be impactful in our uncompromising commitment to students and to the state. And so a lot of exciting things going on in Grizz country. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, um, I'm very excited. And, and I just really wanna reiterate my gratitude, my gratitude to the UM family for everything that, uh, that this campus has, has pulled together to, uh, to achieve this semester. Um, but again, to reiterate my thanks to the entire system and to this body. Um, this has really been and will continue to be uh, obviously a societal and collective challenge, this pandemic um, and collective problems require collective solutions. And I, and I think the Montana University system has exemplified this year that this year and, I, and I'm deeply grateful for it. So again, thank you everyone for an opportunity to share a few highlights with you. Uh, we miss you here, uh, but we look forward to, uh, to having you back here soon. So I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, President Bodner. And uh, we certainly wish we could, we could be in Missoula with you. Um, that, was a, that was a great presentation. Uh, obviously there's, um, 
there's a, a lot of energy on campus, both with uh, uh, thinking about s solutions and innovations to deal with uh, the current issues that um, the, that COVID-19 has brought to campus. But uh, I think you've just done a wonderful job of, of thinking about the balance between the present and the future and really putting the energy and the time into um, what what it means to be, what it will mean to be the flagship uh, of, of the future. So we're really excited to see, um, you know, the future work of the university design team. And I, I just wanted to call out a, a couple of things. I know last year we um, we, we had discussions um, in every regents meeting uh, across the university system, really highlighting uh, the the regents. Um, efforts and, and energy around increasing the retention rates in the university uh, system. And uh, a six percentage retention rate uh, year over year is, is, is absolutely huge and something to, to be proud of. And I know there's, there are many things that uh, the University of Montana campus has done to, to be able to, to boost the retention rates uh, that much. So, you know, we, we thank uh, everyone who had an effort in, in that. Um, I also wanted to, uh, to highlight um, one of the things you mentioned about um, University of Montana being uh, uh, considered one of the top 10 colleges in the uh, United States uh, for responding to and addressing uh, COVID-19. I think that's something that gives uh, the, the system in the state of Montana great pride, and uh, we are, really appreciate the innovation from the research side to the work that you're doing on contact tracing to um, being a, a significant and valuable resource in, in testing COVID tests in, in the state of Montana. So we really thank you for, for that work. Uh, and another thing I know um, we've been grappling as a nation uh, with racial discrimination and having uh, real conversation uh, about equity and, and social justice. And I know that's really at the core of, uh, of your, one of your priorities at the University of Montana. And it's exciting to see um, the willingness uh, of the campus and the community to really engage in meaningful, difficult um, conversations around social inequities uh, in, in our communities. And I think there'll be a lot of benefits to those conversations as we learn and grow as, as a community and how to, how to work together uh, in the future. And lastly, I guess, um, it's, it's a big deal that uh, the University of Montana has been able to reach uh, in Campaign Montana that $450 million uh, campaign goal. Um, I mean, it says a lot about the efforts on campus and it, it says a lot about, um, you know, our, our alumni and our, our biggest supporters commitment uh, and belief in the University of Montana um, and the, the role it plays in really preparing uh, young people for really bright futures in Montana and outside Montana. So big kudos um, to you, uh, President Bodner, and, and to the team there in Missoula. Uh, with that, I think we'll, we'll transition over to uh, the next item in the agenda. Uh, Commissioner Christian, um, the floor is yours for your sister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks everyone for joining us, particularly, I uh, always like to extend my thanks to board members who I know are incredibly busy with all that's going on across the country right now to uh, always be available to help with uh, questions, answers, and the time that you dedicate to serve on this board it is greatly appreciated. You know, uh, as we approach Thanksgiving, a, a target that we've had in our sites uh, for a very long time now, really since we made the decision to try to end a bit early, uh, th this has been the goal. Um, there really is an incredible amount to be thankful for. Uh, I, I really do uh, appreciate the efforts and I, I echo the comments made by Chair Lozar and President Bodner all across the Montana University system. People have just went to extraordinary lengths uh, to, to make this semester possible. And uh, the resilience that everyone's shown to get there is, is truly incredible. I had the pleasure yesterday of um, uh, sitting in on a MSU students graduate presentation for 
uh, to present uh, a dissertation and defend. And uh, Chelsea Wilson is that individual's name. Great job, Chelsea. Uh, but more important, the work that she did really focused on early engagement from traditional age students in that college experience, in person, face to face, that first week on campus, a week of learning and a week of engagement. Um, but even more important, that first six weeks on campus, how incredibly important it is that students have that time on campus and that campus engagement and the absolute correlation between student success, uh, both in retention and completion and, in, and a myriad of other factors in those first six weeks. Uh, the, the data is incredible. We've known it sort of anecdotally, but it was, it was welcoming to see uh, as part of the presentation. And I think it speaks a lot to this semester. You've heard uh, Deputy Commissioner Tessman say early on, you know, even if not every student gets to the tail end of this, every day that they get to spend on campus is a valuable day. That campus experience, uh, that, that new learning, that new engagement, has incredible attributes for students and the long-term success of those students. So while I realize uh, the efforts uh, that have went on across campus, the, the tremendous pressure that's been put on staff to keep our facilities open and clean, uh, just the incredible tireless work from our faculty, not only in helping through a variety of modalities that changed week to week, uh, in the academic pursuit of our students, but also as our faculty helped those students cope with the emotional aspects of the pandemic and, and, and all that it brought and the, the confusion that lay. And of course, uh, the students themselves, you know, we said from the get go, the we can do all we can do to try and make this face to face semester a reality, but it's a lot of it's going to come down to the students interest in participating wearing masks socially distance. Uh, doing the right thing. And, you know, it, it the, the, the ability to get uh, even close, I realize we're a week away, but to that target is just speaks volumes to all that have, that have been part of that. And so I truly uh, am appreciative of all the efforts. You know, we've seen certainly uh, students, faculty, others that have been stricken with it. Um, I've always been proud, or I've been proud throughout this semester, that our campuses have mirrored the communities that we're in. Um, we haven't had uh, outbreaks that are necessarily tra tracked to the campus activities themselves, especially to learning. Uh, and we kind of all stuck together and, and made it through this thing. And I, I think that our efforts to do that, uh, and, and I know some days people wondered, is this all worth it? But I think uh, the data would suggest, and I, and I think students will, will tell us as we move forward, it was worth it um, because that, that first leg up on their learning, uh, not only for those incoming students, but that ability to be face-to-face -face and truly get the campus experience and the overall learning experience that those students bargained for has been uh, incredibly helpful. So I thank everyone. Uh, you know, part of what we did when we approved the Healthy Fall work is we asked that uh, my office would come back with a, 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 an update of kind of where we head next. I'm very proud of the work that that Healthy Fall group did. Um, so proud that we've sort of moved to uh, remove the fall from it and we continue to engage with the Healthy MUS Task Force. Um, but I'd like to have Dr. Tessman share a few thoughts on the work that is ongoing, uh, not only that's happened throughout this semester since our last meeting and our last report to you as a board, but also sort of where we think we're headed uh, as we look toward uh, our winter session, our snow mester, uh, and then into spring. So Dr. Tessman, if you're on, the uh, floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, you can hear me all right? Okay. Uh, so I, I'll keep my update uh, fairly brief. It's good to see you all, um, that's for sure. And I, I suppose the first thing that I will do is give a brief status report. Um, as Chair Lozar and Commissioner Christian mentioned, we are, uh, well, including today, five instructional days uh, from the end of the fall semester. Not that anyone is counting. Um, 
though we certainly are and have been for, for some time. Uh, I say that with a smile on, on my face. I think uh, it, it is a good thing that we've been able to get this far through the semester. <clears throat> but I, I, I will very briefly echo the uh, chair's uh, comments and, and the commissioner's comments about how big of a lift this has been uh, for, for our faculty, uh, really having to teach across uh, different modalities online and in person, oftentimes at the same time. Uh, to conduct the research that we know has been so influential in helping us combat the COVID pandemic, faculty have stepped up in a way that I wouldn't say is surprising, but is certainly remarkable. Uh, uh, students, as Commissioner Crench Christian mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of talk of, well, students are gonna be students coming into this semester and how uh, can we possibly expect them to adjust to the new realities of, uh, hygiene and distancing and mask wearing. And I, I think that the students passed that test with, with flying colors. Uh, no one's perfect, no campus is perfect, no state is perfect, no human being is perfect. But I think that um, it, it is very fair to say that our students rose to the challenge and, and that was absolutely a necessary condition to make it uh, through the fall semester to this point. And I wanna thank um, our student leaders and our students across the board. And then we, we don't always mention it. Commissioner Christian uh, and, and I talk about this uh, all the time. I'm glad that he brought it up himself. I will bring it up as well. Staff, uh, I mean, these are folks who uh, are uh, almost more than anyone else on the front lines. I mean, supporting students academically in terms of their mental health and wellness, um, uh, oftentimes physical presence, uh, you know, sort of most is, is sort of most demanding for staff in terms of spending time on campus. Um, and so, I want to thank staff uh, as well. There's no doubt that there's been some heartburn, and, and as Commissioner Christian stated, I, I think some some heartache uh, this fall. It has not been easy uh, to make it through to this point in the semester, but it absolutely has been worth it. It, it, it is now with the benefit of some hindsight, right, looking back on the fall semester, um, it was absolutely the right decision to come back uh, for in-person instruction and, and on-campus student life. It was the right decision to end the semester uh, in person by Thanksgiving. Uh, I, I think we're on calls with our national colleagues all the time in, in the logistical challenges around trying to, to, to have students leave and return to their hometowns for a week or so during Thanksgiving, gather with family and friends and then return to campuses. Uh, it, it's, it's daunting to say the least. And so I want to recognize the challenges that our registrars and advisors and faculty had to overcome given the scheduling changes, but I think that that decision was absolutely uh, the right one. Uh, at the state level, uh, we continue to coordinate. Um, I, I've just passed through some thank yous. Uh, there are more thank yous, of course. Our statewide partners uh, have been uh, un unshakable in their support of the Montana University system. Deidre Murray in our office has, has met almost daily with COVID coordinators across DPHHS, uh, DES, uh, all of our campuses, of course, and they've stayed engaged, they've stayed uh, vigilant, and, and Deidre's work is commendable. Uh, certainly our partners in the governor's office, uh, Major General Matthew Quinn has been a huge supporter. So a lot of thank yous, but as I said, this is not a time for a victory lapse. I think it's a time to reflect briefly on the fall. And then uh, I'll spend the rest of my few minutes here talking about what we have uh, ahead of us. Um, the Healthy Fall Task Force, which we are now referring to as the uh, Healthy MUS Task Force, because indeed it is not uh, relegated to the fall uh, only, did meet last week. We met last Thursday and we had a good wide ranging discussion, a good debrief on how the last couple of months have, have gone. Uh, and I guess the primary takeaway from that conversation is that it is, it is time for us to, to take a moment, have our task force representatives re-engage their campus teams uh, you'll know that each of our campuses has a, a, a COVID planning team. Uh, President Bodner mentioned their uh, coronavirus uh, uh, response team. All of our campuses have some version of that. The task force members will go back, re-engage uh, those campus teams, obviously re-engage campus leadership. And what we'll look to do over the next month is to update, refine, refresh those planning guidelines so that as campuses uh, enter the spring term and look uh, toward the spring and beyond, the guidelines continue to be useful. Uh, clearly, 
the public health situation continues to change. Uh, we learn more and more about uh, uh, testing, uh, therapeutics, vaccine timetables, and we wanna make sure that uh, our guidelines remain up to date. I will give you an update uh, if you like at our, our January call uh, and, and let you know how the Healthy MUS Task Force has chosen to refine uh, it, its guidelines and recommendations, and, and you'll be able to look at those recommendations and make an assessment. Um, there were some specific topics that came up during our, our Healthy MUS meeting last week. One, one point that's, that's been mentioned, uh, I think, at every board meeting since the pandemic began has to do with mental health and wellness. And, and I wanna let you know that uh, that has been the most salient topic of conversation uh, among the Healthy Task Force uh, members, not because it's the only concern, but because uh, it's something that has become uh, uh, more visible and more challenging and more urgent, I think, as the pandemic has continued to wear on. So, uh, we are looking at specific recommendations related to uh, mental health and wellness, not just for students, but also for employees. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we have been able to work uh, with, with the governor's office and secure some significant support to bolster uh, mental health resources on campuses, specifically with respect to technology. Um, and we want to make sure that uh, students and employees who may be uh, suffering some through, through some of the effects of isolation or, 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 or uh, quarantine have uh, something handy, something on their, on their phones that can connect them uh, more easily to resources that, that can uh, let them know they're not alone, let them know what they have at their disposal in their community and nationally so they can make it through uh, what is uh, undoubtedly a difficult period. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, training programs that can be conducted virtually for uh, employees and students uh, so that they're better equipped headed into the spring. And then a, a referral service that will allow students and employees to be connected to mental health counseling resources uh, uh, throughout their community, throughout the state, especially those that offer virtual, um, virtual assistance, which we know will continue to be important. The task force is also uh, focused of uh, of course, on, on kind of scheduling and planning moving forward. Commissioner Christian mentioned the winter semester. Uh, the winter semester uh, 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 will look a little bit different on uh, our various campuses, but more or less the spirit here is to offer some continuity uh, during this slightly extended winter break, allow students to continue to make progress toward their degree, allow them to stay connected to uh, their peers and their campuses over the winter. Uh, and uh, I, I'm excited to see how, how the winter semesters uh, play out across the state. We have four-year campuses engaging, two-year campuses engaging, and I'll give you an update. Uh, if not in January, in March, it may take us a little bit of time to, to get data from the winter semester. The spring semester, of course, um, is daunting to look at the spring, uh, given, given what we see in the state right now. Uh, and I will remind you that the task force, our team at OCHI, uh, is, is looking at our environment daily. Uh, and we will continue to adjust and adapt as necessary. But a, a clear message can be given right now, and that is that our plan is to have a spring semester that, that looks more or less like the fall semester. Uh, not that there will not be improvements. Uh, I'm sure that our faculty will continue to work uh, at, uh, on their instructional challenges associated with this kind of blended environment. Um, we'll make other adjustments as well, but we will plan to be back for an in-person uh, uh, academic and student experience in the spring. Again, uh, constantly adapting and adjusting given what we learn on a daily basis. As we look to summer and fall, uh, it's challenging for our campus partners. I spent some time this morning communicating with registrars and uh, enrollment folks and financial aid offices. Uh, you know, we have to plan ahead in the academic world. And so there is already a ton of pressure on these individuals to finalize arrangements for uh, the academic year 21-22. The bottom line is that uh, the pandemic has taught us we need to stay on our toes and we need to be more flexible and adjustable than we ever thought we could be. And so um, we don't have any firm guidance to offer for campuses on the, the next academic year. We have so much uh, to learn with respect to vaccine timetables and availability, uh, therapeutics, testing options, uh, the spread of COVID in our state and campus communities. 
And so uh, I am and our office is asking campuses to sit tight and, and to make sure that we stay as adjustable as possible moving forward. So I'll wrap up, I've been way too long already, but there has been a whole lot that's occurred this fall and uh, there is a ton to be proud of. The, the decision we made required so many upfront costs, energy, resources, stress, anxiety, so much work in order to make this fall semester happen the way it did. But the return on that investment is a generational return on investment. Students who didn't stop out that otherwise would have and probably would have never come back. Students that chose to transition straight from high school onto post-secondary education who may have never gotten back on track if they took a, a, a gap year. Uh, continuity in learning and progress towards degree. That return on investment will pay off for decades to come for students, for their families, and for Montana's economy. So it was absolutely uh, the right decision, and I could not be more grateful to everyone on this call and, and everyone across the system for making it possible. I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I suspect I'll get in trouble uh, already for how long I, I've gone on. So thanks very much, Commissioner, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Um, much appreciated. A, a, a couple of quick thank yous and we'll take some questions. Um, you know, I, I, first of all, the, the healthy fall task force, the worst that was done there is incredibly important. And it was a gathering from all across the MUS that brought those thoughts uh, to the table and ultimately put them in front of the board and the support of the board uh, in those efforts that, that made this possible. Um, Honestly, though, this semester, the progress we've made couldn't have happened without tremendous support from uh, Governor Bullock and his team, General Quinn. I mean, so many times we've called and said, oh, we need more money. Uh, he's made resources available. So many times we've called General Quinn and said, you know, we're, we're falling behind testing on one campus and he's mobilized state resources to get there. Uh, that it, it, it's, not, it's not a person, it's really the team over there that has uh, been with us through this uh, journey. And then uh, maybe honestly, most important, and I've never been good at uh, uh, handing out thanks, but uh, our, our own uh, Dr. Brock Tessman, he was a clean shaven, bright young man with a strong future <laughs> when this semester started. Look at him now. He's, <laughs> kind of got an old man beard and he's, he's it, it's going to be rough, but uh, all kidding aside, I mean, I've gotten draft communications at midnight from uh, Brock that were revised by 6 a.m. and beyond. And uh, it, it, he's burnt the candle uh, unbelievably uh, this fall. And, and uh, we're going to talk through some introductions of other tasks he's taken on despite uh, all, all the things been on his plate with the healthy fall, but I, I thank you for that and anxious to take uh, questions from the board. If you've got any for Brock or I, Regent Sheehy. Question for Brock. Brock, has the task force talked at all about um, uh, any kind of participation in a vaccination program when that comes? I know that's early for that, but is that something where the campuses might be uh, at a higher percentage participation than other places, it seems like a great place for us to uh, be involved. Uh, uh, Regent Sheehy and, and uh, Chair Lozar, members of the board, I, I think uh, some of that is really taking off right now. And, and I may pass the, the mic to Commissioner Christian because I know he uh, is a participant on, on that sort of initial planning uh, panel around uh, vaccinations. And I, I think there may be room for some others from our office on that, but we've been plugged in. I think some of those plans are still coming together. Uh, so no firm news on that, but we are in the loop and, and I would suspect that we'll have our seat at the table and make sure that uh, we have as much a shot as anyone to, to get in uh, when the time is right. Uh, Commissioner Christian. I, yeah, I yeah. Um, Regent Sheehy, Mr. Chair, members of the board. So the, the governor has seated uh, a task force, a committee to deal with prioritizing uh, how vaccines will flow. The federal government has given some guidance in those four buckets uh, that they've identified, but they really have left a lot of discretion up to the state. Um, so Brock's exactly right. We will have a seat at the table in that conversation. Um, and, and that is uh, first meeting, I believe is- uh, Coming up here. Yeah, coming up in the next day or two. So uh, we'll see where that goes and where that conversation goes. So I, I think it's one of those, uh, stay tuned, but we absolutely will have uh, part of part of that conversation. 
it would seem appropriate to have vaccinations at uh, the March Board of Regents meeting if they're available. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, point well taken. <laughs> Any other questions before we, we leave this topic, uh, Regent Tess? Uh, Dr. Tessman, has there been any noticeable or appreciable difference in the resources that have been deployed to fight COVID um, on the smaller campuses? Have you noticed anything different between the flagships and the smaller campuses in terms of what they have to succeed? Uh, Regent Tuss, uh, uh, Chair Lozar, members of the board. Uh, appreciable difference. Uh, I guess in some respects, yes. I mean, uh, there's no doubt that some of our smaller campuses uh, don't have the kind of behemoth health facilities uh, in nearby and in public health offices across the state, of course, are, are stretched thin, but in our smaller communities, they tend to be even, even more stretched thin. So sometimes things like uh, contact tracing resources and whatnot can be a bit more challenging for our smaller campuses. But here's where I think the statewide coordination has, has really um, been to our benefit. By pulling all of those campuses together, and quite truly, it was every day uh, for some time, Deidre Murray, every day uh, pull those campuses together to talk about their needs, talk about where they may be falling behind a little bit. And, and either with the assistance of uh, one of our flagships or with the assistance uh, of, of DPHHS and state resources, we're able to get some more tests to one area or send in some folks that could assist with contact tracing uh, or, or mapping as they called it for a short period of time. So I, I would say, you know what? Yes, the reality in Montana is that we have very different campuses with very different resource bases. But when we, we saw, you know, some lights start to turn yellow and red, we're able to pivot and, and sort of send in, uh, send in supplemental resources from the state level in order to, to keep things on the up and up. And I, I do think, uh, just to be I, I mean, blunt, we've been in some, some stickier situations on some of our campuses at different parts of the fall. And every time we've been able to pivot, get the support to those campuses, get them over the hump, and we've been able to, to continue to, to plug away and, and keep the campus open and, and move forward. So yes on the differences, but also I, I think kudos to the state in terms of getting resources where they need to be. Thank you. Okay, uh, Regis Sexton. Um, thank you, Commissioner Christian. And I understand there might not be an answer to this question yet, but do you know of any funds that have been set aside for subsidizing the cost of vaccines when they might be made available? Uh, Regent Sexton, Mr. Chair, members of the board, you know, that that is part of the sort of federal debate too. Pfizer said that there wouldn't be a cost. Um, the, uh, the federal government is talking about how they would uh, either provide or subsidize. I think that that is still kind of early on. Um, and whether, you know, by the time it gets here, there's still, or, or the CARES money has been renewed and we can use it for those type of things, or there's new legislation that's introduced. Um, I, I think it's uh, too early to tell. The, you know, the, the good news is there is work that's starting to happen around that. The logistical challenge of moving the vaccine across the country is significant. Uh, the challenges associated with the temperatures that they have to be maintained at and that I think is particularly challenging for rural Montana. The Pfizer drug right now is minus uh, 94 degrees. Um, the Moderna one is, is a little more promising, but you know, we'll, there's, there's groups starting to form to deal with all of those and certainly the cost to our campuses and students is something that will help to try to address. Dombrowski has her hand raised. Regent Dombrowski. I um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tessman. I have to uh, agree. You do you do look a little bit uh, weary, and I uh, we, I share that with you um, personally. I'm sure I look the same. I just want to make two comments. One, um, I have been uh, asked to participate in the state vaccine uh, coalition, and so to whatever degree there's any appropriate information to share, I'm happy to do that. You know, from the healthcare standpoint, the work and the focus on vaccines and appropriateness and distribution is very, very uh, uh, on top of our state's mind, given our rural nature. And uh, I am confident, given the state's 
ability to pull us all together and do the right thing for the citizens of Montana that in fact that will happen with vaccines as well. So I just I, I want to put a shout out to the support that the MUS system received from the state is very similar to the support that your healthcare providers have received. And my second comment is that um, as a healthcare provider, we were very focused on, uh, at least in Missoula, and I'm sure the same across the state, on how the university was responding and contributing or not. And I'm very pleased that the University of Montana uh, poorly contributed to the incidents of COVID. In other words, uh, we did not have to worry about the university or what was occurring there. It was on point. It was the numbers were reported and, and we really felt confident. I am sure that was the case, Brock, from your leadership as well as across the state. So I would just say thank you for that. The citizens of Montana should be really very um, proud of those efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Dombrowski. That is uh, incredibly meaningful comments. Um, Okay, well, I think we're gonna, before we, before we pivot to the next uh, topic, I, I think one of the things that we talked about uh, in our July meeting around the Healthy Fall Task Force was um, an emphasis on mental health of our students. And I'm glad that uh, Dr. Tessman, you provided an update that that was uh, indeed an emphasis of the work um, across the university system this fall. I, I guess my question is, uh, knowing that we, we're going to have a, a gap between a, a longer gap between the fall semester and the winter semester you know what are some of the services that uh, will be available to our students as they leave our campuses and likely experience um you know significant uh, issues around the pandemics in the communities they'll return to well chair lozar and members of the board um so a couple of a couple of ways to respond to that. Um, uh, one way to respond to that is we have focused our efforts quite a bit on our our ability to deliver remote remote counseling, remote assistance, remote communication, and I think that'll serve us well uh, during this time when students depart, when most students depart campus. Um, you know, I, I I would remind everyone on the call, I know we all know this, but while, while students oftentimes will leave for the breaks and, and we, we don't see quite as much of some of our faculty, the reality is our campuses do stay open and, our, and many of our faculty, certainly many of our staff, folks working at the, the Curry Health Center, for example, in Missoula um, are, are working. And so they are available. I, I, I think that's important to note. They'll continue that work. We also, um, have finished this semester with a series of conversations among our student affairs officers, among our chief academic officers. We've asked them to pool best practices on student engagement sort of upon exit this fall. So really ask them to share what they're doing to make sure they have good uh, last contacts, meetings, confirmation plans for the spring, communication plans uh, with students over the winter break. I don't have enough details on it. I will mention one of our campuses just got in touch this morning and, and they're having a, a, a systematic effort to have peer to peer outreach during the winter break. So they have students who are, are working on work study over the winter break, reaching out to their peers just to check in and see how things are going. And, and that is not the same as having a mental health professional do that, but it does still, I, I think, serve as a point of connection and could be quite helpful. So we, we are redoubling efforts, I think, the break is a bit longer. We're conscious of how stressful that's going to be uh, for students, uh, but I think we have some good plans in place. All right. Well, if uh, we can, then we will move to uh, the next topic. Um, speaking of our July meeting and our July retreat, uh, I, I think at some point I commented to the board if uh, it, it is where we work on work plans and sort of set the agenda. And we talk some about the fact that, you know, if we can survive the pandemic, uh, do our best to prepare for a legislative session, that there probably literally wasn't much bandwidth left for a lot of other things, either at the campus level or uh, the OCHI level. And uh, that that is sort of uh, a, a truer than maybe I would have hoped statement. Um, the one exception to that, though, that we mentioned then and that we've certainly kept uh, alive and well is, is this notion around our Montana uh, student resident student access initiative. Um, that's something that's long been a priority of the board, both in access, affordability, um, 
but a notion that we really enhanced a couple of years ago uh, at our meeting in Billings when we started talking about how do we get a larger percentage of Montana students to participate uh, in the post-secondary education. Not, not everybody needs to be headed to a, a four-year degree or a graduate degree, but everybody that can needs to participate in some post-secondary education. And that has really been the focus of now a couple of year efforts, uh, including what became shared policy goals uh, with, the, with the legislature. Um, we talked some at our September meeting, we were a day or two away, if I remember right, from the uh, central app going live and, and where we were at. And uh, we continue to, to work on that. I'm incredibly pleased with the, the progress we're making. I think um, we will have something to go back and uh, talk to the legislature about as, as we adopted shared policy goals around this. And I've asked um, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, and uh, I, I believe uh, Scott Lemon is also gonna participate, but if they could uh, give us a little insight of where this is at and where it's headed. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, I'll go to you first and you can take it from there. Sure, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, Regents, good afternoon. Um, in the, I'm a full-time believer of having the person who's closest to the fire and really the person who's driving the progress on this now uh, do the speaking. So that's Scott Lemon, and uh, he's our Director of Enrollment and Admission Strategies. You heard from him last time, um, and, and I, he's prepared to give you a five-minute update. Uh, the rest of our crew here would be uh, more than willing to help answer any of the questions that you might have, but uh, I just say take it away, Scott. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Mr. Christian. Uh, it's been a great couple months. Uh, I would like not to completely backtrack, but just highlight the, the great work that uh, was mentioned was being done on COVID response and keeping students healthy as it pertains to enrollment and what we're trying to do in resident student access, uh, particularly with uh, what's going on uh, in, in Dr. Cheskin's world, uh, the commissioner, the governor, all the support that we received from the board. Uh, you know, we've got two main lanes here. We're trying to keep students safe that are currently on campus, but if you look forward and then our world in enrollment, we're constantly looking forward for uh, what's next for these students, resident students, uh, but the state of Montana overall, and it's keeping them safe, giving them the confidence and transparency to communicate a safe and healthy learning environment. So I applaud the efforts that are being done. It certainly uh, ripples into the work that we're, that, we're, that we're doing here in enrollment. And so I, I thank you all for the work uh, there. Last time I spoke, it was two days prior to the uh, Apply Montana launch in the new central application. And while we had grand uh, uh, thoughts and positive uh, things to, to talk about, we had no idea how it was gonna go, quite frankly, uh, two days prior to the launch. And I'm happy to report that it went exceptionally well uh, Apply Montana, the central application system for the state of Montana uh, has been the focal point for College Application Week. Uh, we've seen what appears to be record numbers, albeit we've extended that College Application Week by two weeks. We were able to build dashboards and provide real-time data uh, for OG uh, internally and also to communicate with high schools, how they were doing, how the progress was going through College Application Week um, overall. It's a tremendous success there. Over 10,000 applications have been created and submitted to date through Apply Montana alone. Uh, again, we've got a baseline year here to measure uh, upcoming things, but these all, all, all appear to be record numbers for college application week. So really um, a testament to Angela McLean, her teams, the work they put into college application week. The campuses, I applaud your efforts in, in communicating the value for uh, getting students and driving traffic to Apply Montana uh, overall. A couple quick updates that we've we've enacted here as well. We, we've made a huge push to be more collaborative with campuses uh, through, my, through our office here at Ochi, the work we're doing through Apply Montana uh, will be the resident student access portal build out uh, as we continue to work on, on, on those areas. But to see this, we've launched an enrollment leadership committee here uh, with all the campuses, head enrollment teams to, to continue to communicate. To my knowledge, the first time this has happened uh, at the system level to allow folks uh, who are in a relatively competitive environment uh, to be more transparent and, and do what's best for Montanans to engage uh, public post-secondary education. So incredibly proud of the campuses uh, for the work we're doing there. Uh, it's an ongoing thing. We're making adjustments. We've taken feedback from campuses from the day of launch, uh, from Apply Montana, the central application to today. And so that feedback continues to be refined. Uh, we've, we've made adjustments in how we're communicating with students in the in-progress applicant space. Uh, we're taking feedback currently for next year's application, as hard as it is for me to even uh, talk about that sometimes. This application cycle is going incredibly well. We're already working on retooling uh, the 2021 application. 
uh, currently. So we've got them both going on at the same time. Another really exciting initiative that uh, we're working on with uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor's help, his team's help is system-wide. We wanna look at application data. So Apply Montana is incredibly important. Uh, we also wanna look at how are we doing from a system level perspective, um, total apps that are being generated from all the campuses collectively, uh, and ultimately start to look at yield rates, conversion rates, and different opportunities for us to measure uh, state efforts overall. And great data, uh, total apps in state, from this point last year to today, we're up 37% in applications for the state. That is all in state. Uh, and then system-wide for all applications that is in state and out of state uh, for all NUS campuses is up 41%. And those are enormous gains in applications. Uh, we're seeing College Application Week generated roughly 8,100 applications during a two week period. Uh, I'll say that again, 8,100 applications were uh, generated during a two week period. So we're seeing some really encouraging numbers this early in the season. Keep in mind that's normal. We expect to get the bulk of our applications coming in. Uh, most states, most schools, and most systems would, would appear on November 1st as a benchmark for early decision deadlines and different things that schools are driving traffic a little bit earlier overall, but we're incredibly encouraged uh, by the data we're seeing right now. And then it turns to yield. And so as we talk about next year's application season, we're gonna continue to see a lot of uh, applicants hopefully come through. We've got a lot of other strategies in place here to, to continue to try to cultivate more opportunities for Montanans to apply using Apply Montana as it will be free all year long. Uh, some of the data and back to the, the COVID work that, that's going on here um, that is tremendous for us to be able to communicate the value in, in engaging post-secondary education was that a recent survey uh, was conducted that roughly only 47% of all high school seniors have applied uh, to college, which means the majority is holding out from, from applying uh, to any post-secondary institution overall. And so I share that with you to note that a lot of students are holding off, we know nationally in, in choosing to apply to college. 90% of those that are reporting, holding off their application to college are reporting fear and anxiety. Uh, that's the number one reason students are delaying their application uh, to college. It's fear and anxiety. A lot of that is COVID driven, we know. Uh, it's the uncertainty that exists right now. So the more certainty and transparency that we can provide in the work that's being conducted, uh, across all these teams, the support we're getting from the very top uh, through our office has just been tremendous. And so I applaud those efforts. Uh, we, we hopefully will see a lot more applicants uh, come through as, as long as we're able to continue to provide more encouraging information uh, about the, the COVID vaccine and how we're responding as a system uh, to support student safety overall. Chair Lozar had commented a little bit earlier on what's next and in the big project uh, that's next is the resident student access portal. This is something that we've been working on for quite some time. I'm fortunate enough to come into this environment where a lot of work has been completed on the resident student access portal. It's a very unique project. As you all know, we, we have a lot of different stakeholders that want to engage and communicate effectively to help Montanans engage post-secondary education. Uh, the three themes and categories we're going to focus on uh, through uh, college, career, and cost, and also students, parents, and educators. As I mentioned in the last presentation I gave, we're looking at a phased approach. Um, we're happy to report that we're very much on schedule. We've completed the RFP process and what appears to be somewhat of record time. Uh, we're able to get through a very robust and meaningful RFP process. I thank the committee that was involved uh, for their efforts in, in allowing us to select uh, a nationally uh, ranked vendor that has done tremendous work uh, with a variety of universities ranging from Harvard, Cornell, and MIT to Rutgers University, University of Alabama, as well as smaller institutions such as Tacoma Community College and New Mexico Tech. So we've got a vendor in iFactory that has done uh, some, some really amazing projects that have impacted uh, uh, many, many campuses and students from all walks of life uh, and, and really understand what we're trying to do with the Resident Student Access Portal. Uh, I also reported that we'd like to share some viewable things and tests by December. We're very much in line with being able to do that. Uh, for anyone that's interested in our progress, we'll, we'll be happy to share that as we get that up and running. And so these are some big uh, lifts and I, I thank all the teams that have been involved to date with the Resident Student Access Portal uh, and for the work that's gonna be upcoming. The larger build out will take some time. But we're hoping to get uh, the, uh, a good amount of the work we're trying to implement here in December so that uh, we can have our students engaging, our, our parents in, in the state of Montana and educators some of the most uh, impactful feedback we've received, I would say in this office through Applied Montana College Application Week uh, have been from students and parents and high school counselors themselves. And we've had to repeat multiple times uh, that no, the application is really free and it's free all year long. And, and here's, uh, here's how you 
uh, can apply to every campus in the state of Montana under the MUS. Uh, and they're just blown away with the, the ease of accessibility, uh, the way that we've communicated that process and the value. We're saving Montanans a lot of money and we're continuing to remove barriers. And so Resident Student Access Portal is gonna be another huge part of that. And we're gonna connect a lot of the great work that's been done from a lot of my colleagues uh, and a lot of the folks in the leadership team as well. I, I couldn't be more proud and, and happy to uh, be a part of this project and, and be on this team. Um, it's been it's been an honor to, to get this far in such a short and condensed period of time. And uh, there's a lot of people working very hard. And so I really applaud the efforts of my colleagues uh, and our leadership team as well. Uh, I'm happy to take questions if it pleases the board. I will turn it back over to uh, Deputy Commissioner Trump. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, that's, uh, that concludes our report. Thank, thanks, Scott, Tyler, all that have uh, worked on this. Um, you know, it, it's it's been a, a an ongoing journey, and a lot of people at Ochi have participated. Um, Scott uh, has been a a, a much welcomed uh, addition. He's sort of taken a great idea and picked it up and just run with it. So I appreciate all the work that's uh, going on there. Uh, before we leave this topic, does anybody have any questions for Scott, Tyler, or I? Looks like uh, Regent Nystuen had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Deputy Commissioner Tessman, and Mr. Lemon. Um, could you talk a little bit about how we're making sure we're safeguarding, you know, pretty sensitive information that is we're accumulating and transmitting uh, to the campuses and so forth? Uh, just give us a, a, a frame of reference as to how we're how we're making sure that uh, data security is a top priority. Thank you. Regent Nystuen, uh, thanks for that question because it is of top of mind to us. And that's one of the reasons why we contracted with Liaison initially. Liaison is a national uh, company that uh, has done system-wide implementations on the order of Cal State University that has 500 or over 500,000 enrollments. Um, they're proven themselves in their ability to uh, not only uh, uh, service the students, but uh, adhere to the highest level of security with their data. Um, we analyzed that during the RFP process. Uh, we're, we're assured they're uh, up to all standards, national, federal standards on data security. And key to that point is that when a student applies and indicates a campus, that data is transmitted to that campus. So we cut down and minimize the amount of transaction and handling of the data uh, goes directly to, from the vendor to the campus. Campuses then pick it up, pick it up put it in banner and, um, and, and go through their marketing and recruitment process with the students. So um, we are uh, ultra certain that um, we're doing everything possible to ensure the security of our information. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Tessman. As a follow-up, um, how are we ensuring that the campuses are timely following up on these uh, very warm leads uh, and making sure that uh, you know they're getting information right back out, responding back to the students? You know, we put a great investment into this project, which is phenom gaining phenomenal results. What I'd like to make sure is that our campuses truly are saying, "Okay, here we go. We got a live one." Let's. How do we how do we make sure that student enrolls here or or within our system? Thank you. Yep, uh, Regent Nystuen, uh, again another great question, and that's part of what uh, Director Lemon mentioned there when we talked about the the data side of this, and it, that's critically important. Establishing uh, the new avenues of data, which we've never um, really uh, made a, a use of in this system, which is the admission side. And so um, it's going to take us a year or so to establish baseline data um, based upon this new process. But we certainly have the connections in place to be able to track um, those students um, as they are migrated from the completion of the application to the campus information system, and then ultimately uh, to an enrollment in the Montana University system. Now, there's going to be some interaction that goes on between the campus and the student that we may not be as privy to, um, but I, I am fully confident that we can set um, some fairly basic metrics where we can measure uh, campus uh, responsiveness and um, actual yield um, 
and and bring that forward as 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 really true metrics related to this initiative. Uh, Scott, you might have more detail um, to add to that. Yes, uh, thank you, Deputy Commissioner Trevor and Regent Nystuen, uh, Chair Lozar, members of the board. Uh, one of the biggest adjustments we made was in, in hearing from campuses um, is, 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 is uh, allowing them the ability to communicate more effectively on the in-progress applicants. So to your question, um, that's a big change that we've made since the last time I spoke is we've conducted uh, uh, system-wide training for all campuses to engage and communicate uh, with these in-progress students. Every uh, applicant that creates uh, or starts that process through Apply Montana will receive an email notification with uh, MUS information, customer support information, and then we're allowing campuses to engage the in-progress applicants at the time that they become in-progress, meaning they've started but not submitted an application. So uh, what uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor alluded to is that uh, us, the work for us is really in the tracking of that. How do we look at what conversion rates occurred with campuses that engage students in the in-progress space and how do we uh, how do we begin to build on the position of looking at system level data based on the applications that Apply Montana is generating. So uh, we know it's only one piece of the pie. Campuses have an application. Most campuses are receiving applications directly from their campus site and current existing uh, models they've had in place. And that's great. Uh, they've got their own CRMs. Many of them are very different, uh, but we want to amplify those efforts and allow them the ability to communicate, which is a big change that we've made uh, since the last presentation we gave. And so we're, we're excited to share that and, and we, we, the feedback we received from the campuses is, is very encouraging. So those students are being communicated with. Thank you. Regent Sexton. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor and Director Lemon. Congratulations on the success of your project. I think everything you have to say is really fantastic. Actually, it's probably blown away a lot of people's expectations. Um, my question has to do with the demographic data. If I don't know how disaggregated your data is, but when you noticed all these increases, are there any specific groups that have benefited the most or significantly from this application process? Regent Sexton, uh, Chair Lozar, members of the board, thank you for the question. Uh, we, we have not, we don't have the data uh, desegregated to that effect. Um, I know that the work that uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor's team is, 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 is working on now with some of the data and looking at the overlays, I believe eight to nine years, and then the incoming data we have with Apply Montana, uh, we'll be able to provide more updates as far as where the largest gains uh, in the state of Montana and, and to what what uh, ilk the the populations are are impacted um, the most. So we're hoping to provide more. This is kind of a brand new. We just got this, I think, four days ago, uh, so we didn't have a chance to really get in and, and cut the data as much as we'd like. But we hope to continue to provide more information. And as Deputy Commissioner Trevor alluded to. It, it truly is a baseline and, and we're, we're really looking forward to over, overlaying this data uh, semester to semester and year over year. Great, thank you. Yeah, Regent Sexton, that, that's a fantastic question and one certainly top of mind for us. Um, you know, it's not by by chance that we have uh, Angela McLean, our, our AMA director, is an integral part of this. Um, we think we can make some true gains in those that in the past have been least communicated with and so that's certainly a focus as we talk about this 40% that haven't participated in education. Um, certainly a disproportionate number of those are from demographics that haven't been well re represented. And so that'll continue to be a, a focus of this overall effort, this resident student access. Awesome, thank you. Tyler, I'm, I'm just curious about some just general feedback knowing that this has been a, a sizable system effort, um, brand new to the system that's involved uh, is certainly every campus can, can constant consistent communication with admissions offices and uh, enrollment management offices. I'm just curious so what the feedback you've received you know over the past two months in the rollout of uh, apply Montana. Uh, thanks for that question Regent Lozar um, and, and as uh, we're all well aware uh, without the campuses uh, and, and their participation, this project doesn't get anywhere. And um, we've had, uh, as with any major system uh, initiatives, um, ups and downs, bumps in the road along the way for the last year and a half. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, the campuses have stepped up big time. And in the last two months, I would say more than ever, um, that group that Scott spoke of, uh, really it's a, a group of enrollment managers. They're um, a combination of uh, folks who run the registrar's office uh, and also the admissions and uh, and sometimes wear multiple hats. 
but at the end of the day, their job is to focus on uh, getting students to attend their campus. And, and I, I think that's where th this is really exciting to us is, and I, I've said this before, is this is a new role for OG and having Scott's position here is completely new. And, um, and we need to engage these, these people, the admissions uh, crew, the enrollment folks. Um, we, we're gonna have a, some system-wide meetings coming up and um, never before has that group really had, a, had its own constituency and, and kind of a spotlight on it, but things have changed. So I, I think that um, with a broad brush, I would say that this has been highly supported by the campuses. Uh, it's not to say that people aren't critical at times, and, and that's what's going to make it great because it is so important to those folks on the campus. Their jobs are uh, oftentimes intrinsically related to um, increasing enrollment or and in growing the admissions uh, data. And, and so we respect the fact that they are uh, highly interested in this change, but um, we, we greatly appreciate the overwhelming support and um, really the, the acceptance of the fact that this is the best thing for the state of Montana. Excellent, thank you. And just due to the lack of uh, the lack of a beard, it seems uh, that it's apparent that Mo Apply Montana is going well for you as well, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, <laughs> we appreciate uh, time we've spent on these last two items. Um, our uh, agenda certainly lists, again, the campus reports. As always, there's some fantastic information there for you all. Um, in addition to that, I would, I would remind uh, everyone on the call that we have the musings that is published every other week. I appreciate Karen Ogden's work on that. Um, and if you notice on those, we're starting more and more all the time to include some campus highlights. I, I, I'm just blown away when I read those at the, uh, the, the, the things that are going on around the system, even despite uh, all the challenges this year, uh, good stuff. So hopefully you'll take time to, to look at the campus reports presented here and those musings. Anyone that doesn't get uh, the, the musings every other week, email this office or me and we'll make sure that you get signed up. It's gaining a, a good following of over uh, 3000 people at this point in time and we get good readership of that. So appreciate uh, everyone's efforts that go into these campus reports and into the musings reports. Um, I wanna to move to a few introductions, um, starting with a few myself, first on the uh, list. You know, every year the, the governor's office does uh, awards, uh, awards across state government, recognizing individuals that have really served their um, institutions well or, or their, their corner of state government for us. Uh, that individual awarded this year is, is our own John Thunstrom, who heads up our uh, information and technology side of the house for the entire MUS. And uh, I, I just wanna say he is incredibly important to us and has been a, a godsend of information, uh, especially as we've worked through the portal and some of the things that we've done. So we uh, uh, acknowledge uh, this award and congratulate John on uh, receiving it. it. It means a lot to, uh, to us that uh, John, Don, John has been recognized. Um, a, a couple other things, I have uh, a, a few announcements to make, then we'll get to the campuses, uh, starting with uh, a, a congratulations to two individuals that have greatly served uh, the Montana University system uh, and higher education across the country. I'm pleased to announce that uh, Dr. Beth Weatherby, our chancellor at uh, University of Montana Western has announced her retirement uh, starting uh, this spring after a 30 year career in higher education. Uh, she's well deserving of uh, the next chapter in life. She took the helm at Western uh, a, a few years into the experience one uh, and has really helped empower the campus to make that the, the keystone of uh, what is happening there and, and helped raise awareness both at a local and national level of uh, the good things that they're doing at Western. She's built strong partnerships across the community. Uh, and I think truly has positioned that campus well for long-term sustainability. So congratulations to Beth. Um, we, we wish you well in retirement and uh, all, all the best uh, on the next chapter. And then also, um, 
departing after a 45-year career in higher education is uh, Susan Wolf, our Dean CEO at MSU Great Falls. Uh, a, a true product, uh, an MUS native, got her a bachelor's degree at Montana State University some time ago and has worked tirelessly to serve uh, education, higher education uh, across the country and, and most recently in Great Falls. Um, built some incredible relationships with the community there, has worked to build new programs, new facilities, uh, as noted, uh, successful in the last legislature in bringing the dental hygiene clinic updates uh, to fruition and are well on our way uh, to, to a four and a half million dollar project there that will serve that community in the, in the greater state of uh, Montana. So Dr. Wolf, uh, greatly appreciate your service over the years and congratulations to you as well. As leaders transition out, leaders need to transition in. I'm proud to announce several of those today, starting uh, with uh, our, our own hometown here in Helena. Dr. Uh, Sandra Bauman has agreed to serve as uh, Dean CEO of Helena College. As you all know, she's served uh, in an interim role there since May, uh, but is already bringing an absolute clear, solid, stable vision to that campus. Been incredibly well received and frankly, if you could pick a really rough time to start uh, your career as a higher ed administrator, administrator COVID would be uh, the perfect backdrop. Um, but she stabilized that campus. She's done uh, great work and we're very thankful for her uh, taking the helm. And then uh, uh, the last addition to our leadership team, I will turn it over to very capable hands of our, our uh, own president Cruzado to uh, introduce Thank you so much, um, um, Mr. Commissioner and members of the board. Um, I would like to take a little uh, a different approach because um, this, um, this new position or disappointment that I'm about to announce uh, was made possible by the hard work of an incredible advisory search committee. You know, the way in which academia conducts searches is one of those points of, of mystery for boards of, of regions ar around the nation. Uh, why does it take us so long to conduct uh, searches, particularly for executive positions? And uh, this search uh, uh, committee for our MSU Billings Chancellor took a very different approach. So on August the 27th, we announced a seven member search uh, committee composed of Steve Arbischaug, our executive director of the Big Sky Economic Development, uh, Jim Barron, who is the chair of MSU Billings Faculty Senate, Janae Cross, who's the chair of staff union, Joey Honey, the chair of faculty union at MSUB, Vern Gagnon, who is the chair of, of the faculty union at City College MSUB, Bill Kennedy, the CEO and executive president of uh, MSU Billings Foundation, our very own Bob Makwa, the executive vice president and provost at MSU, Martha Sheehy, who needs no introduction, uh, and James Unzaga, who's the president of uh, the student association at MSU Billings. This advisory search committee was aptly chaired by our deputy commissioner, Brock Tessman. Uh, and we showered him with much deserved praise earlier. And I just need to tell you, seeing, watching Brock in action was a sheer delight. So this group immediately announced um, public forums. And when I joined them, I found the campus who had a clear eye about what they needed in their, in their new leader. They, they wanted uh, a vibrant leader, an energetic leader, a leader who's uh, ambidextrous, if you will, right? Who could uh, use the right hand and the left hand with uh, equally well, the heart and and head, the two sides of the brain, meaning uh, someone who could recruit students, who could inspire and acknowledge faculty and staff, but also a leader who ha would have a presence in, in the community. Um, and then of course, I heard loud and clear that they wanted a leader who could stay and would stay with us for a long time. 
And then the surge uh, concluded on October the 9th, uh, when in an unprecedented move, the um, surge uh, proposed me uh, uh -huh. that we announce a sole finalist. And I went along with their recommendation and we were blessed uh, that their sole recommendation accepted our invitation. And uh, Dr. Stephanie Hicks, Hicks well, it's not a stranger to anybody in Montana. Um, Stephanie holds a PhD in educational administration from University of Texas at Austin, a master of education from MSU and uh, a baccalaureate degree from uh, University of Montana, Missoula. See what I told you about being ambidextrous? Um, <laughs> she, uh, she is also very well known because she devoted seven years uh, to serving as president of, at Miles City Community College. She also occupied prior to that some positions of leadership at Flathead Valley Community College and then the last almost eight years, um, Stephanie has had a stellar uh, uh, presidency at Northwestern College in Wyoming. Um, Stephanie, it's just everything uh, we were looking for. And in her apt hands, we are delighted to put this incredible campus uh, that we have in Billings. Actually, I should say our both campuses, right, MSUB and City College uh, MSUB. So welcome Stephanie Hickswa to as Chancellor of MSUB. Thank you, President Cruzado. Welcome to Stephanie, Sandy, all of you serving, uh, we, we appreciate it. Um, also extend a thanks to uh, Regent Sheehy for serving on the committee. She gives us lots and lots of time and this is yet one more thing, but uh, greatly uh, appreciate her willingness to serve there. Her presence uh, meant a lot to the community and the work that got done there. And thanks to Brock for uh, chairing that search. Uh, and frankly, thanks to Brock for chairing the uh, effort to let us to uh, Sandy Bauman at Helena College as well. Um, I know we have uh, a few other announcements from the uh, campuses. I think, uh, Montana Tech, I see uh, Les logged in there on the screen. I'll let you go first. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Hello. Good to see you. I um, I will also echo some praise to Brock because he was the he was the chair that that got me here. So thank you, Brock. I won't go on and on, but thank you. <laughs> um, so we are delighted to have with us our new vice chancellor for finance and administration here at Montana Tech, uh, Michael Van Alstein. He comes to us from Oregon and was most recently had his own um, independent organization, but has spent time at uh, the University of Washington at a research institute and has spent a lot of time in high tech working with um, Microsoft and other places. So we're, we've, this position has been open for almost two years, so it feels really good to have a vice chancellor for finance and admin on board and, and Michael started with us this week, so thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Cook. Uh, President Bodner. All right, thank you, Mr. Commissioner and uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'm happy to announce three new members of the University of Montana leadership team. Uh, and first, in uh, September, we welcomed uh, Mary Krita, uh, who joined U of M as our new Associate VP for Enrollment Management, uh, working closely with uh, with, uh, with Scott, Scott Lemon and team there, but she leads our admissions, financial aid and alumni teams, uh, joined us from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where she uh, was the Associate Vice Chancellor for Enrollment Management and uh, previously had served as both the Director of Admissions and Director of Recruitment. Uh, Mary brings an impressive uh, uh, career uh, and experience uh, leading university-wide strategic enrollment processes, uh, very excited to, uh, to have her here uh, in the UN family. Uh, we also had join us uh, just last month, uh, Dr. Alan Townsend as the new Dean of the WA Frankie College of Forestry and Conservation, uh, and also the Frankie Professor of Forestry and Conservation. Uh, prior to joining us here at the University of Montana, he was the provost at Colorado College. Uh, uh, 
Dr. Uh, Townsend is originally from right here in uh, in, in Missoula, and uh, I think he is a, he's a Sentinel Spartan, so uh, he might he might battle a little bit with my uh, my Hellgate Knight uh, of life, but uh, but we're so happy to have him back home here at uh, here in Missoula. He's a he's an ecosystem ecologist uh, and uh, has nationally prominent research. Uh, includes work on nutrient cycling and, and biogeochemistry in tropical forests and global scale analyses of, uh, of the human impact on major element cycles. Uh, great administrative experience as well. We just couldn't be happier to, uh, to welcome Alan and his family uh, here to the UN family. And finally, uh, on October 1st, we were so pleased to officially name uh, switch from interim and, and strip away that interim title uh, from Dean Suzanne Tillman, uh, who we announced as the Sprunk and Burnham Dean of UM's uh, College of Business. Uh, she served as the interim dean since May of 2019. And prior to that was chair of the Department of Managing, Management and Marketing. Uh, Suzanne's background uh, is actually in mechanical engineering uh, as well as business strategy and entrepreneurship brings a depth and breadth of experience and knowledge and a great love of, uh, of, of UM. Uh, spent seven years prior to getting her PhD working in industry uh, and, uh, and is also no stranger uh, to Montana. Uh, grew up, uh, obviously, uh, many of you know, uh, Haver has it and, uh, and Dr. Tillman hails from, from Haver. Uh, spent a number of years teaching at, uh, at MSU Northern, um, and uh, we just couldn't be happier to have uh, Dean Tillman uh, leading our, uh, our incredible college business. So thank you very much. Thank you, President Bodner, and welcome to your new team members. Uh, I think that gets us to, uh, I think it gets us to the end of the introductions. If I missed anybody, Apologize, we can come back. Before we leave, though, uh, last comment I would make, uh, Mr. Chair, is I want to extend a truly grateful thanks to Chancellor Grotheth, who uh, will probably be uh, retired for like a third or a fourth time before uh, we meet again in January. Um, we we truly appreciate him step backing in, step stepping back into the role in Billings, uh, creating some stability there and. Uh, unprecedented times and the work that he's done. And so Chancellor Grosseth, uh, I can't see you on the screen, but I wanna thank you for your uh, tremendous leadership and your dedication to the MUS uh, once again. So thank you for your service. With that, Mr. Chair, I uh, believe we have concluded the work of the commissioner's report. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Christian, for a very thorough report and update on some of the most key uh, priorities in the system uh, at this point in time. I, I did just want to extend our, our, our gratitude or my gratitude, and I'm sure the gratitude of the board for uh, the, the service that Beth and Susan has provided to, to the university system. And we, we really wish them a, a wonderful retirement and um, we, we, we welcome all the new leaders into the system. Um, and you're joining a, a family that cares very deeply about uh, the future of our students and the future of our state. So, so welcome to the Montana University system. Um, we're at that point on the agenda where we're gonna make a transition to, um, to what's up Missoula, uh, an opportunity to really uh, engage with uh, what would be the local uh, campus community that we would be meeting in. And as, as we've mentioned earlier today, typically we would be at the University of Montana and in Missoula today if it weren't for the pandemic. So we look forward to uh, a panel uh, of community uh, members from Missoula. And I know uh, Interim Provost uh, Humphrey uh, will be setting up uh, the introductions for the panel. Um, so the floor is yours, Provost Humphrey. Thank you, Chair Lazar, uh, Mr. Fisher, Regents, uh, and colleagues. Just want to uh, echo uh, my thanks uh, to everyone in the system uh, to get us to this day and through next week as well. It's really been a heavy lift for faculty, staff, facilities across the system. And I'm, I know I'm as proud of, of, of our folks in Missoula as you are at your respective campuses. And, 
this is an opportunity for us if, if, if to take a few minutes to uh, to have a video that's been prepared uh, done as What's Up Missoula that will highlight a few of our leaders who are putting partner with place into action. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then we'll proceed to a panel. I always wanted to say this, roll the film. <laughs> UM provides our students with a valuable education, drawing on a rich diversity of disciplines, playing an essential role in societal and economic impact in our state of Montana. During the pandemic, we've applied that same mission-oriented work to make a lasting difference in our community during these unusual times. In the fields of health, business, humanities, and the arts, Members of our UM faculty are taking on new leadership roles during the pandemic. The following video gives a glimpse of the impact that UM leaders are making outside the classroom, in the community, and across our state. We are the only uh, formal academic health department in the state of Montana, and one of only a handful in our region. We shifted our research mission from dedicated basic research, which is alive and well here at the University of Montana, to this applied approach, and we're doing everything we can to sort of help out the state and the university meet its testing needs. Every year we do an educational outreach tour. We take a short play to over 50 schools, uh, community centers, and libraries across the entire state of Montana. This year, however, we realized that we couldn't safely tour. Why don't we do an oral history project around COVID-19? And in many ways, the BEAR program was just a more was a formalization around sort of capabilities that we were offering already to entrepreneurs and businesses in the community through the Accelerate Montana program. We had decided to do this show called Zombie Thoughts, which is about helping young people deal with anxiety. And in a world in which there's a lot to be anxious about right now, we thought it was important that we go ahead and do this show, to find a way to do this show. You know, we, we embrace this idea of being educators, of being scientists and pursuing our own research, but also being a part of the local community. If you have an idea or if you're in business uh, grappling with a particular issue, we're here to try to see if we can point you in the right direction, give you a bit of coaching or connect you to some resources. For example, we have a couple of faculty that are working with the health department to predict trends of COVID uh, within Missoula and really getting into the numbers of what is the demographic of, of people with COVID in, in, in Missoula. So that future researchers can, you know, say in 20 years, they want to write a history of um, what it was like to live during the pandemic. We have, you know, now 20 interviews that are available for researchers who can, you know, use that material. It's an uh, effort from the whole community, not just for this lab, uh, we from uh, uh, the graduate student, uh, postdoc, lab technician from uh, around campus. Uh, many labs come to, together over here uh, to meet the challenge of the personnel. It's a win-win for me in terms of helping those entrepreneurs hopefully succeed, but also sort of leveraging and creating experiential learning opportunities for our students as well. For a lot of these kids, the play that we take to their schools or their library or their community center, it's the only theater that they see all year long. It might be the very first piece of theater they've seen. Uh, so we felt it was important to figure out a way to keep going and not, not just skip these schools. They love to see us, they depend on us coming. That history is not dead, history is alive. And in the classroom, we do that by thinking differently about the past, by asking new questions of the past. In this type of internship, oral history project, we're actually seeing history being made right now. And where better than a flagship university than to have this sort of standing level of highly trained um, personnel. A flagship university doesn't exist just to serve students on campus. It also takes proactive, meaningful action to positively impact our community. The COVID-19 pandemic has challenged us at UM in ways like never before. But it's also reinforced our mission to reach beyond the classroom, to prepare our students for a lifetime of learning, and to fulfill the vital role that our community needs during unprecedented times. Thank you. Should be good.
uh, in this 2D environment, <laughs> it's difficult to, to manage everything. But uh, as you uh, as uh, as you heard from President Bodner's introduction, uh, he referenced the Bear Program uh, for Economic Assistance uh, in Missoula. The Zombie Thoughts play seen by thousands of K to 12 students. Uh, uh, to, to diminish their anxiety and uh, and the academic partnership we've had with Missoula City County Health Department, which has really been vital to uh, study, project, and and model the impact of uh, of the virus. Uh, I would like to introduce for this panel my uh, my the, some key architects of these efforts, uh, and uh, I, I'm going to presume you're out there. Uh, Michael Legg, who's the artistic director of the Montana Rep Theater and the architect of the Zombie Thoughts. Uh, uh, effort, Paul Gladen, who's director of the, La uh, the Blackstone Launchpad at UM uh, and uh, engineer of the Bear program, and uh, Dr. Aaron Sennens, uh, who's an assistant professor of epidemiology in our School of Public and Community Health Sciences at UM and uh, is a key member of, uh, of a really important team of, uh, of faculty that have, uh, that have contributed to this. So, uh, I'd like to open the floor uh, to questions by the regents of, uh, of our panelists. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Pro, uh, Provost Humphrey. And uh, I think that was a really good, great introduction through the video of uh, some of the really interesting things that are happening uh, both in community as well as uh, on campus. So. At this time, I'll, I'll turn it over to um, some members of the, the Board of Regents to see if they have any questions for, uh, for Michael and Paul and Aaron. Uh, Regent Rogers. Thank you, um, Michael. That uh, performance sounds like such a good use of an opportunity to reach out to folks when they're needing a little bit of community these days. Um, did you hear any sort of recurring themes feedback from the students that you presented to or any interesting takeaways? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so far, we're only about a month into the distribution of the play through an amazing platform that that's one of our partners built for us in the School of Media Arts. And we've already reached over 4,000 uh, students with this production. Uh, nearly half the counties in the state have had at least one school whose students have watched it. And we've also involved uh, uh, guidance counselors across the state. And I think mostly we've been hearing from them and, and from a handful of teachers and students who are saying that, you know, they've, they've been looking for opportunities to try to have discussions surrounding mental health and specifically discussions about about how this particular pandemic is affecting their students and, and the opportunity to show this in classrooms and have guidance counselors present when it's showing has led to some really amazing conversations afterward where kids are talking openly about their concerns and their fears and ways to cope with them. And so we've been, we've been really excited that that's, that's the feedback we're getting. Other questions or, or comments from members of the board? Uh, Regent Rogers, follow up. I'll go again. Uh, this one's actually for Paul. Um, Paul is the bear. We have a, a bear program here in Gallatin County that's to support uh, small businesses with various technical support. Is your bear program something similar or is it pretty different? It's a uh, it's a little different. Yeah, we were aware of the uh, the alternative use or that we were creating an alternative use of the bear acronym. But uh, for us, it was uh, business emergency assistance and recovery. Uh, so it was very um, deliberately driven around uh, the COVID um, program. So very much dealing with, um, I mean, in some ways similar to the um, broader sort of business expansion and attraction activities of economic development organizations, but predominantly we were focused on very small entrepreneurs uh, that often didn't have access, uh, or ready access to their bankers, to attorneys, to CPAs, to help them navigate this environment and really try to provide uh, quick and easy or direction to how to access some of the CARES Act uh, programs uh, and other advice, just trying to help them adapt to this environment. So it was it was much more specific to this environment we're in right now, rather than the broader um, sort of train of economic development activity. Great, and how many uh, businesses have you been serving with that so far? We've seen about 75 
businesses reached out to us uh, since I think we started in um, kind of early mid April. Uh, a strong push of businesses, uh, particularly through that sort of March to sort of June, July period, particularly as the CARES Act sort of fund programs were available. Uh, it reduced a little over the summer, but we're certainly seeing some pickup. And in fact, I had two requests just come in yesterday, I think, as, as clearly as we move into uh, the fall and winter, uh, it's going to place a whole set of new pressures as, as are the rising cases of COVID. So, Yeah. Well, thank you. It's such important work and so great to see how our university systems can partner in supporting our business community as well. It's great. Thank you. Uh, Regent Sheehy. I have a follow-up for Paul. Um, will, it's actually two questions. Will the BEAR program continue after the COVID crisis, if there is indeed an after? And number two, um, were you able to coordinate with the law school at all to get some uh, student lawyers help? Um, so on the first question, uh, the, the BEAR program I, I will, will sort of stay in place as long as it's sort of necessary and appropriate. Um, as I said sort of briefly in the video, in some ways it's really just a, it was sort of a branding and a kind of accessibility to the resources that we already had at UM through the Accelerate Montana program. So those resources will continue to be available uh, sort of beyond COVID. So um, we'll, we'll see how long sort of the BEAR uh, branding as it were stays, stays in place. Um, in relation to, to law students, um, we did not have law students specifically helping out on some of the bear um, requests, although we do have um, good relationships with a number of attorneys, uh, both in Missouri and across the state that we were able to tap into to provide uh, assistance. And we did a couple of uh, webinars with a couple of law firms uh, helping on those. Separately, the Blackstone Launchpad has a legal office hours program where we actually have two students who do their law clinic with the Launchpad. Um, so we have law students getting direct experience working with entrepreneurs, uh, just not directly associated with the BEAR program. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Regent Sexton? Um, yes, thank you. I was actually wondering how I could access or view the Zombie Thoughts program. I thought that was very interesting, specifically regarding anxiety. Yeah, I mean, we we got a lot of, of, of corporate and individual support that allowed us to offer this to every student and every school, but also every per, every person who lives in Montana for free. So all you have to do is go to MontanaRepZombieThoughts.com. And uh, if you're an individual who lives in the state, you uh, request an access code and then you can watch it. Fantastic. And I had a follow-up, actually. Do you see yourself... Um, expanding that or doing it another type of play based on kind of how this all evolves? That's such a great question. Uh, you know, as you can imagine, we're proponents for live theater and, and for the sort of transformation that can happen when people gather in a room to share a story together. And we, by no means do we want to give that up. But what we found is that this platform has allowed us to reach more than twice the number of schools that we usually have the capability to reach. I mean, we're reaching schools, for example, on, um, it was a school uh, specifically that we'd never been in it before called the Hart Butte School on the Blackfoot Indian Reservation. And, and you know, if, if, if our way back to those students is to, is to make sure we're doing a combination of both live theater and using some sort of alternative, you know, a delivery method, then I, I think we should do that because it's in our mission. It's in our mission to serve the people of the entire state. So yeah, we'll figure it out. Fantastic. Excellent. Um, Regent Dabrowski. Hi, thanks. I, I feel like I, I know all of you. I live in Missoula and I see, I'm very um, fortunate to see the, uh, your works and exactly, Michael, I actually took my granddaughter to the very first zombie thoughts out there at Ogren Park. And um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it's every bit as good as Michael is saying. It's, it was very interesting. Um, Reed, I'm going to turn to you for a minute. Um, many of you maybe know uh, Reed Humphrey actually sits on my board, and we've been in contact really around uh, COVID and vaccine development and the role of the university. And I, I just think, Reed, it might be beneficial from your your eye as interim provost to talk to talk about what how the university contributed to that in Missoula, and you know maybe turn it over to one of your other folks. But I, I think there's I think there's a bigger a bigger story there. Is that fair? Well, of course it's fair. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to sort of 
uh, re-emphasize the role the universities played, both from a research uh, perspective, uh, and I think that's been fairly well articulated in, uh, in, in the COVID response. Uh, I think there, in, in, in uh, President Bodner uh, uh, made reference to some of the, some of our efforts on campus relative to the, uh, to Riz Health and uh, and our use of peer students to to uh, to really help engineer a, a really what I think has been an exceptional campus response. And uh, I think that's been good across the system as well. I think it was really quite unique here. It really has been an all hands. I mean, it really like every campus, but it's been an all an all hands on deck effort here. I, do, I also think that uh, uh, that our uh, unique relationship with Missoula City County uh, Health Department has made it an, a, a, a significant difference. And so, uh, with uh, Chair Lozar's indulgence, I would I would like to turn to Aaron Simmons for a moment to help us understand the importance of an academic health department uh, and how it's actually influenced uh, the COVID response uh, in uh, in Missoula. So, Aaron, if you're out there. Oh, thanks very much, Reed. Uh, so um, I didn't actually know what an academic health department was two years ago, but it's because we just recently formed this, this partnership in, in fall of 2019. So uh, timely establishment of that partnership. But the, the idea is that it's, uh, it's you formalize this relationship between a local or county health department and an academic institution that offers training in, in health professions. And it's kind of like the public health equivalent of a, a teaching hospital. And the, the goal of these partnerships is to you know, provide training opportunities, increase research, uh, service opportunities for, for students. Uh, but you know, we're, we're public health, so of course the, the overarching goal is to, is to benefit the broader community. And so you know, pretty early on in the pandemic, we reached out to the local health department to see if there, you know, there was something we can do to, to help out. Um, and so we've, that, that partnership has, has strengthened over the last, I guess, seven months now where we, we meet with them once a week and go over, uh, current trends in Missoula and COVID. Um, and we've given a number of press conferences now to try and, uh, help emphasize what we think are the most important, um, public health messages to get out there. And then we've, you know, offered some internal trainings. Um, to their staff on, you know, some epidemiologic methods, and um, but it's it's been a really strong partnership. I think you know our group has learned a lot, but it's it's cool because it's a, a bridge, you know, between county health and the university. We have two other epidemiologists um, on our epidemiology situation unit, which sits within the incident management team, COVID response for the for the county, and um, and so then we're able to pull from other expertise in public health um, in our school at UM, including, you know, for example, Aaron Langoth, another a faculty member in the School of Public Health is modeling um, COVID hospitalizations, resource needs for the entire state. And so we can kind of translate those findings um, to the county level and, um, and bring what we're hearing at the county level, you know, back up to the state. So it's been a really, um, it's been a really valuable partnership and it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, why why we went to school to get training in what we did and it's it's been it's been a really good thing to be a part of the last several months thanks very much reed thank you aaron is there any other comments or questions from members of the board you know i had just one uh question similar in nature to regent sexton's in terms of um the video, I was, I, I thought it was such a cool idea to uh, the work that's being done on the, the oral history project um, of capturing some insights from the lived experience of the, uh, the pandemic. And I'm just curious where, uh, where we're able to, to view um, some of the, the, the conversations that you've been able to record. Anyone? Yeah. I don't think we can hear you, Provost Humphrey. So 
Oh, shoot. I think we lost him. They just need to work on their audio feed a bit. Well, I think, I mean, I certainly will have the opportunity to follow up uh, with you, Provost Humphrey, on, on that. I just really excited to see <laughs> what that looks like and what some of those stories are. I, I want to thank you, uh, Provost Humphrey and Michael and Aaron and Paul uh, for your willingness to share some of the insights. I, a couple things that I heard um, uh, multiple times was uh, the connection with community, the bridge with community. And I think it's, I'm, I'm always so impressed by uh, the, the marriage between uh, the University of Montana and uh, the Missoula area and the, and the region. And I think you very much underscored that um, today in, in the What's Up panel. So thank you, uh, uh, Provost Humphrey and others. We are going to uh, transition to uh, the next part of the agenda. Uh, we've got some remarks uh, by Governor Bullock. Uh, Governor Bullock is not, not able to be with us uh, today. I think he's visiting his, his daughter, uh, but he has um, he's recorded a video for, for the regents. And so, uh, Amy, if you could roll the, roll the film. Good afternoon. Sorry I couldn't join you live, but I'm away spending some time with my oldest daughter. But I want to take this moment to thank you all for the incredible work that you've done to keep students, faculty, and staff safe. And want to congratulate you for nearly making it through the fall semester during what really are unprecedented challenges. While our campuses certainly look different this fall, I'm pleased that our universities and colleges were creative and thoughtful in ensuring that Montana students receive the quality education they expect and they deserve. We have certainly overcome so many obstacles over the past nine months, but as federal aid is expiring and cases continue to spike in Montana and across the country, but really overwhelming our hospitals as well, we know that additional challenges are on the horizon. One of our greatest challenges continues to be getting Montanans to take this virus seriously. I know that students and faculty, as well as the rest of Montana, are eager to return to normal, but the virus is more present in our communities than it's ever been before. And we need to act like it. I wanna thank you for communicating with students and faculty about how to mitigate exposure and hope you'll continue to encourage your students to follow the guidelines that are in place over the holiday break to support our efforts to, to slow the spread of this virus. We're doing everything that we can to leave Montana in a strong position for the new administration. And this means continuing to acquire PPE, securing testing supplies and preparing for vaccine. It also means proposing a responsible budget ahead of the 2021 legislative session. Earlier this week, I rolled out my final proposed budget as governor, and it's one that reflects, I think, the values that Montanans hold. The budget I released is balanced, leaves strong reserves, and protects the services that Montanans rely upon without making cuts or increases in revenue. It'll also make critical investments that'll benefit Montanans now and into the future. It builds on the investments we've already made in both K-12 and higher education over the years, including a proposal to provide 4.6 million over the biennium in need-based aid for residents seeking two or four year degrees, an increase of 18.8 .8 million over the biennium for the university system, and $5 million into the Montana Research and Economic Development Initiative. I know that our future leaders will hear from all of you during the session about the meaningful difference this funding will make for our students, and that they'll seriously consider this proposal. Thank you again uh, for joining me and continuing to urge folks to adhere to the guidelines and continue to look out for one another so that we can all get through uh, this global pandemic. Thanks for everything that you all do. And I look forward to speaking with you all at the Board of Education meeting that's scheduled for next month. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. Sorry I couldn't join you. <laughs> uh, well, 
I know we don't have the opportunity now to, to ask any questions of the, of the governor, um, but on behalf of the board, we, we, we thank you, uh, Governor Bullock, for your eight years as uh, Montana's governor. Uh, you always prioritized uh, education and prioritized ed higher education um, in your budgets uh, and, and your work and engagement with our, with our communities. And um, we look forward to uh, the conversation tomorrow with uh, the Board of Education. I know it'll be an important conversation, but M McCall, if you could uh, extend our gratitude um, from, the, from the board to, to Governor Bullock and his, his service uh, to the state and his commitment to the Montana University system. Uh, and with that, um, we will turn it over to remarks by Superintendent Arnson. Um, I, I'm not sure if she is she's on right now. She's she's not on right now. If uh, if Superintendent Arnson does join us, uh, we'll make sure we carve out uh, some time for for her remarks. Um, and so, with that, uh, I believe we'll be taking a, a short break uh, right now. It's it's two twenty. So, how about we come back? Um, and in 15 minutes at 2.35, and we will do the virtual campus tour of University of Montana. And thank you, Chair Lozar. If campuses would please just go ahead and mute, mute your lines and turn off your videos, we'll, we'll be back shortly. Thank you. Okay, excellent, welcome back. Um, we're gonna dive right in. You can see uh, the next item on the agenda is a, a virtual campus tour of the University of Montana. Uh, you know, if we were in Missoula today, we'd be uh, we'd have the opportunity to walk around uh, campus and and certainly get a a peek at um, some of the the exciting new improvements uh, to the physical plant of the uh, University of Montana and get to the opportunity to engage with <clears throat> some of the campus leaders. Uh, we're because we're not here uh, are there in Missoula, uh, the University of Montana's put together a special video, a special virtual tour of, of the campus. And we won't be playing that uh, throughout the, uh, right now during the meeting, but uh, we highly encourage board members and, and others that are watching um, this meeting to take some time. There's about an eight minute video that kind of works its way through the University of Montana campus. So please check that out. And with that, we're going to move on to the, the last item uh, for this afternoon, um, and that is our Budget Admin and Audit Committee. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Chair of the Committee, Regent Dombrowski. Thank you, Chair Lozar. Um, uh, members of the Regents, uh, I certainly am going to uh, rely on, as usual, um, Deputy Director Trevor to sort of help me out with uh, this particular uh, item and to answer any specific questions. So um, the consent agenda uh, is, I, I would say, um, I don't want to call it lengthy. Uh, it certainly is there and I trust that you uh, have looked through those items and I would just uh, stand uh, probably for questions or for anyone who wants to pull any of the items off the consent agenda to the uh, action items. So I'll just uh, stop there for a minute and see if I, there's any feedback. I'm, I'm not great at Zoom, but I'm not seeing that there are any questions or comments on the consent agenda. Chair Dombrowski? Yes, Regent Tuss. I don't know if now is the time. I don't want to pull any items off. And I know that these are consent items. And so um, I hope that this is appropriate. I, I would just like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Eng Engstrom's service to the Montana University system beyond his professorship and obviously uh, the, the great service that he gave to the state of Montana and the University of Montana during his tenure as president of the University of Montana. I see that he is one of our emeriti faculty recommendations today, and I, I didn't want to skip that without at least acknowledging his great service to the state. Uh, thank you, Regent Tess. I would acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge also that we have ha we had that conversation in the budget committee of uh, yes. ma making sure. So thank you. 
Any other comments, questions on the consent agenda? I don't know if you can see Regent Dabrowski. It doesn't look like there are any other questions. Okay, sorry about that. I'm assuming because I can't, there aren't, but I'm just trying to give time. So can we, um, Amy, can you scroll down then, please? Great. Um, I would just pause there and uh, acknowledge that uh, Regent Rogers, did you have any questions on item Q? Not to put you on the spot, and if you don't at this time, I'm presuming you didn't. actually don't see her at the moment. So, okay. All right. Um, seeing none, let's move to the action items. Uh, a action item A is the request for authorization to remodel Aver Hall. Uh, you can, and I presume that you have read that. And if there are any questions, I'm going to automatically turn those over to Mr. Muffak, who I see here. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, can you hear me okay? Good. All right. Uh, as Madam Chair uh, mentioned, action item A is a request for authorization to remodel Aber, Aber Hall into an administrative use at the University of Montana, Missoula. Uh, as part of the execution of their student services master plan, Aber Hall has been identified as a residence hall that can be converted to administrative swing space to house occupants that will be displaced from the Lomas building as it is partially demolished to make room for the new dining facility. So Aber Hall currently uh, is offline and it's 397 beds are not being used. It was being used for quarantine and isolation space. Uh, the empty apartments at the family housing will be used for quarantine and isolation space going forward. Uh, in this process, Aber Hall will remain part of the auxiliary enterprise. And this remodel is not extensive as far as uh, removing walls or, or that sort of construction. It consists of upgrading uh, lighting, paint, uh, blinds, flooring, and data upgrades. And that'll be beneficial not only to the administrative tenants uh, during their time in, the, in the, the building, but if the facility is returned to the housing inventory and uh, due to the nature of the remodel, it will not cause any significant expense uh, when returning it to the housing operations and the benefits of the uh, remodel will be uh, experienced by the students that will take over in the, the building if it is returned to housing. Uh, this item authorizes UIM to expend $1.3 million in funding from their recent bond proceeds, uh, their bond issue proceeds. And uh, I will stand for any questions as well as Vice President of Operations and Finance, Paul Lasseter, is also available if there's any specific questions. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Muppet. Are there any questions, please? Oh, uh, Regent Nystuen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Director Muffick, uh, could you give us, refresh us again, what the status is on kind of the bigger picture from the standpoint of creating a new dining facility? It sets, it, it, it mentions it in there. Can you give us a timeline, cost and funding source for that, please? Thank you. And Chair uh, Regent Nice too, and I think I'll defer to, to uh, Vice President uh, Lasseter on that. My uh, scope of knowledge is not as in-depth as his. I, I believe there will be an item brought uh, to the board in the near future for about $24 million for the, the new uh, dining facility, and it will be located uh, around the Lomas Center's current location. That's the extent of my knowledge at this point, but I would turn that over with uh, the Chair's permission to Vice President Lasseter. Please. Madam Chair, Regents, uh, thank you for the question. Um, we have been engaged uh, with an extensive uh, review process with our campus architects in reviewing our student life master plan. Um, the dining facility is the single largest expenditure that we're projecting to date. Um, 24 million is approximately the amount uh, that we're anticipating spending on the dining facility at this point. Um, the proceeds from our tax exempt bond issue, that's the series B bonds that we issued last September, will be the primary source of funding for the construction of the, uh, the new dining facility. Um, there are other plans that are also going to be happening in conjunction with dining, uh, renovation of Knowles Hall, 
and uh, other walkways, uh, the Ryman Mall uh, on campus, uh, really reinvigorating and revitalizing uh, the Western entrance to uh, the University of Montana campus. In terms of timing, we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to affect many of the moves out of Lomason into Aber uh, during the end of the spring semester. And we're hopeful that we'll actually be, be able to begin some construction activities during the summer or early fall of next year. Thank you, Mr. Lester. Uh, Regent Tess, please. Yeah, Chair Dombrowski, thank you. Um, I'm still I'm still slightly confused about what it, what is Aber going to be at the end of this. Um, temporarily, we're going to be moving those offices in there. I'm assuming that once Lomason is the construction is complete, they'll be moving back there. Could you no, could you explain all that? C certainly, um, there are, there is a, quite a bit of logistical. Uh, change that will be taking place while the construction of the dining facility and other projects are taking place. The sequence of events is roughly going to be as follows. We'll be vacating the most uh, eastern and northern portions of the Lomason building. Um, whether or not those are the departments that move into Aber is still uh, a question. More likely than not, they will be moved to the western part of the Lomason building. And the current occupants of the Lomas and building in the western part will be moving to Aber. This is principally areas such as human resources, payroll, business services, predominantly back office functions. Um, once the space on the eastern part of the building is uh, vacated, then we can obviously be begin construction on the new, di new dining facility. There, there are no current plans to be moving the administrative functions back into the current mm -hmm. Lomason building. Um, we will likely construct other space in the future or repurpose other campus spaces for that if uh, we need to convert Aber back to student housing. Okay. So, so is it safe to say that there are several floors of that, that multi-story building that will be mothballed? Uh, no, more likely than not, we'll continue to occupy it with areas from uh, across the campus. We've been in conversation with folks from our uh, information technology department, and there are other opportunities as well. Um, the idea is basically to use to concentrate administrative functions in Aber, freeing up other spaces around campus that can be uh, recommitted and repurposed back to student facing activities. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That was very helpful. Other questions on this um, action item A? Okay, uh, seeing none, I'd like to move then to action item B. Uh, again, this is the MUS play, pay, excuse me, pay plan implementation. Just have a couple of comments I'd like to make as you're reviewing this. Uh, this is a, an expected part of the process of the, of the pay within the MUS. Uh, the 2019 legislature passed a state employee pay plan with funding for the MUS and salary adjustments in January of 20 and January 21. Um, MUS negotiated with the unions and arrived at, a, at an approved, a region approved pay plan for raises of 50 cents or 2%, excuse me, 50 cents per hour or 2%, whichever amount was greater again in January 20 and 21. These 2% pay adjustments are budgeted and the board last November of 19 approved the January 20 raises for administrators that are on the board of regent contracts. This item would approve the 2% raises for that same group of administrators in January 21, which is consistent with the budgeted board of regent approved MUS employee pay plan. I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but that really describes that this is of process within the uh, existing pay plan practices. So um, I'll stop there and stand for questions. And if there's some specifics, I'll look to um, either Deputy Director Trevor or I don't know if Kevin is on.
Okay, I'm, I guess I'm not seeing any questions. So that uh, those are the two action items uh, that concludes those two. I'll move to information. Um, A, the governor's budget. I'm gonna turn right to uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor and you tell me anything that you know about that budget because I know nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I might uh, defer to the commissioner to start that off. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, you know, I, I would just simply start with this and, and Chair Lozar acknowledged uh, in, in his parting remarks for the break the, the same, but I, I really do want to extend uh, our incredible thanks to uh, Governor Bullock and his team for the work that they've done, not only in this budget, but throughout the years. Um, I, I feel like uh, we've accomplished a lot in the last eight years. And this is no longer an infomercial. <laughs> it's just a true gratitude for him always prioritizing education. I think we've seen it over and over, whether that's student success or uh, research or all the various factors that we deal with day in and day out. Um, when we've called, he's been there, the uh, access and affordability, he shared the passion of this board to try to make uh, education as affordable as possible. And that's led to three uh, tuition freezes out of the four sessions that we've worked with Governor Bullock and uh, significant uh, resources in the MUS. So I, I just truly wanna thank him uh, as a governor, as an individual and his leadership that he's had uh, with, within the, the state of Montana to see that higher education has been prioritized. I think he, he, along with all of you as board members, realize the value to the individuals that we serve, but also the values to the communities that we serve, the value to the, to the economy, workforce training, uh, all the things that it, we need as a state to have a vibrant economy and a good citizenry. And uh, I, I just want to extend my my thanks. I think this budget once again represents uh, his dedication to higher education, and we can certainly uh, walk through the, the details of that. Deputy Commissioner, I'll give it back to you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, I, I think this is a great opportunity to um, not only explore what's in this governor's budget, but also just uh, begin a discussion and, from, and, and gain more familiarity with the various uh, facets of the state budget um, as it's reflected for the Montana University system. So I just start with the, the highest level overview, um, and that is uh, the change in the amount of funding uh, from one biennium to the next. And so that's, uh, and it, with the risk of sound, sounding oversimplistic, you just total the amount of money for the two years of this biennium total the amount of money for the next two years in the, in, the, in the proposed budget and measure the difference. It's a $37 million increase. And so that leads to the question of what makes up the $37 million increase. And the, the reason I went through that kind of basic remedial math there is that it's real easy to get confused in the numbers because at one point in time, somebody's talking about the change in the biennium and the next point in time, we're talking about the change from the base year. And the base year is the last year of the biennium that we're in. So this year, right now, uh, FY21 is the base year for uh, the next biennium. And then you measure the difference between the first year of the next biennium against the base year, and then the second year of the next biennium against the base year. And it comes up with a slightly different total. And I say that because when we break down the budget by program, it switches to base year increases. So now I'm gonna talk about base year increases. I basically went through that just for those uh, watching online who uh, you know, are, are, are struggling with uh, tallying up all the numbers in the budget. Um, it, it's the reason why we hear slightly different numbers at times. So with that said, 37 million to total increase, uh, the biggest uh, growth there is, you heard the governor mention it uh, moments ago, uh, for our MUS campuses. Um, and that is present law adjustments. And uh, the governor mentioned 18.8 .8 million, I believe, in present law adjustment. And that's absolutely correct. There's also a fixed cost adjustment 
in there that all state agencies receive uh, for things like insurance and IT costs through um, ITSD that actually increase our total amount of present law. And then you throw in what we get for audit as well um, to about $22 million. And then we move from that to, I'm just gonna incrementally work down what, what are the big hitters in, in the budget. Um, there's a $5 million uh, increase, uh, OTO, uh, for the Montana, um, Montana Research and Economic Development Initiative, otherwise known as MREADY. I struggle with that acronym and I don't know why because we've been using it for the last six or seven years. Uh, that's a $5 million uh, MREADY appropriation. Um, then we move to uh, scholarships and uh, we, the governor mentioned the $4.6 million for the access scholarship, 4 million for the actual dollars to go to student. And there are some administrative uh, funding, uh, some of it present law, some of it for uh, to support funding for administration in our office that rounds it out to the 4.6 million. And then um, we go to our agencies, five agencies of the Montana University System and the present law associated with those agencies uh, it roughly comes out to be about $3 million. And if you did the math on, on that, that would be about a three and a half percent increase in each year of the biennium for the agencies. So they're funded at, at a present law, a sustainable present law level. And we have um, traditionally what we uh, always request is an increase to our graduate professional programs for a million dollars. That's the present law increase. It's associated with the rising tuition costs for our grad exchange programs, such as Wichi and Whammy. And also funded in this budget in program nine, which is often included with present law, but I've split out here is roughly a million dollars for new space. And that's for uh, new buildings that have come online in that are coming online right now or have come online recently in, for this next biennium. Uh, it's the state's share of the operation and maintenance of those buildings. It's about a million dollars. So with those primary hitters there and, and a few other uh, administrative present law adjustments, you'd, you'd get to somewhere close on that $37 million biennial increase. And that's House Bill 2. I'll pause for a moment there to see if there's any question before we talk about long range building. Yeah. Tyler, if I could, uh, Madam Chair, just uh, maybe a few more comments on M Ready. Um, you know, it's something that maybe this office sort of takes for granted. Everybody's in the loop on because we did it in 2015, it was highly successful, um, but we haven't talked probably enough about it. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, what, what that is ultimately is state resources that allow us to leverage federal resources. And that that's part of what I think is important to understand about this. It's not necessarily to fund sponsored resource on its own, um, sponsored research on its own, but to help spur the entire enterprise with, with our institutions. And when this started a few years back, we really asked the campuses, what do you need? And in many cases, we need matching funds uh, to, to leverage into federal grants, or we need state efforts uh, to move forward. And, and so the, the amount, and, and you know, honestly, we have requested um, this in the last several sessions, uh, it has been uh, challenging to, to find resources to put into the budget, uh, but it's not been for lack of, of support. And so the amount I don't think is as important as the concept. Uh, I'm very appreciative that the $5 million is in there. It gives us a good starting point. This was a very popular proposal with the legislature, bipartisan support uh, when it was approved in 15. Uh, and, and we continue to get questions about it. Ultimately, the the that 
request that was funded in 15 helped create a number of Montana jobs. It solves Montana problems. It adds to our economy. And that's really what's the driver behind this thing. And I'm very appreciative that at least we got it in the budget as a starting point. And it'll give us the opportunity to talk about it uh, with the legislature. It, it has the ability to catapult us into tens of millions, uh, if not more, of research uh, in, in the MUS. Madam Chair, I'll continue on into uh, LRBP. I, I neglected to mention that uh, we have both uh, Shauna Lyons, our MUS budget analyst, and Ron Muffick, the director of operations and maintenance, not maintenance, but I'm going to say facilities at this point in time because that's what we're talking about, both on the line here to answer more detail. And I'd say particularly about Shauna and the level of information and detail that she has is, is absolutely Awesome and excellent. She's worked on the other side, uh, on, I wouldn't say the other side, just at a different angle in legislative fiscal division and um, brings a, a great deal of uh, experience to this process. So I very much feel like I'm backed up by some pros here. Um, so going into LRBP, you could think of LRBP in three categories and um, that's the capital projects. And then we have the major repairs, which in the past, we would have called deferred maintenance. And then we have your authority only projects. So in the capital projects, um, we have three items that appear there for the Montana University system. And the first one is a uh, the heating system at Montana Tech. And that's uh, having to do with the steam lines or steam tunnels there, converting lines into tunnels or vice versa. I'm not positive. But it is I, what I am positive about is that it's absolutely critical, and they're in a state of disrepair and must be fixed. And I'm we're very thankful that um, A and E and uh, the governor's budget office uh, listened to us. It comes out of what appears to be on top of the list for the capital projects. It's actually split in two for 3.5 million dollars of cash, funded by cash in the capital projects area. Um, the other third of it, roughly 2.5 million, is in our major repair list. So um, it, it's kind of uh, got some good backing double location. Uh, we feel good about that project. Um, also in our capital projects list at the University of Montana is the Forestry and Science Lab building. Uh, that's uh, funded by bonds in this uh, bill at the tune of $25 million with another $20 million in the authority only category. That would be the dollars we would need to raise uh, with other sources. And finally, we have uh, with the Montana Agriculture Experiment Stations at MSU, uh, kind of a dual project uh, combined into one for research labs and the wool lab. That comes out at a total of $11 million in bonds and another 1.3 in authority. So that rounds out the capital project list, the major repairs. Um, Ron certainly has a detail on the various uh, lists. I'll just remind uh, this committee and the board that uh, we saw a list of roughly 40 projects per campus back in May and prioritized that list down to roughly 20 and submitted it to A&E. Um, and uh, in return, we are seeing those projects appear in this bill uh, to the tune of about $20 million. It's uh, really encouraging to see that the MUS has uh, positioned itself so well in this bill. The total amount of major repairs for the state of Montana comes in at 26 million. And so 20 million of that to the MUS um, for a, a whole host of different projects that are incredibly important. And, and those projects, uh, they, they come into that category basically because they show up as uh, repair, maintenance, and renovation uh, for projects that are less than $2.5 million. And then finally, we have the authority only projects. These are for buildings that uh, are proposed to come online during the next biennium, funded by other sources besides the state. Uh, I tell you, I'm up here, it looks like we have about eight different uh, projects listed. One of those projects is general spending authority, which we get 
Um, and it comes to our office and uh, through Director Muppick, we allocate that out to campuses as needed for uh, various um, ancillary projects that come up throughout the biennium. The other seven pertain to specific projects on each campus. The total amount there is 66 million. And I'm sure that rounds out uh, what I have to report. Um, we would stand for any questions that the committee or the rest of the board might have. Uh, thank you very much. I, in my comment about, I know nothing about the budget. Uh, that's not fair to you and your team. You keep us very well informed with the budget. I know it was just released last week and then there is sort of a process here in this transition to a new administration. So I, I wanna personally thank you for that level of detail. Are, are there questions? Regent Tess? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Tyler, if you were the commissioner, could walk us through knowing we're in this um, no man zone where we're, we're in the transition, right, from one administration to the next. And so this is one administration's recommendation, I believe, really, that will be amended perhaps by the next, right? Could you, could you walk us through that process? Uh, Madam Chair, Regent Tuss, I can tell you what I know based upon um, what we've read, and that is uh, this budget comes out on November 15th from uh, the current governor. He has until December 15th to make any amendments to this budget. And then the next administration has up until January 7th to release um, their version of the budget. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Madam Chair, I if, if you don't mind, please, I, please, I would I would just like to echo what Commissioner Christian had to had to say about the M Ready dollars. Uh, those are significant. I mean, th those are those are a multiplier um, that will have a significant and positive impact on Montana's economy. Uh, the dollars that we got in in the 2015 legislature continue to bear fruit for this state and will for years to come. So I'm I'm just I just want to put a plug in. Uh, I'm super hopeful that those uh, dollars will remain in there uh, because with the federal dollars that the commissioner identified, um, they're leveraged over and over and over again. Thank you, Regent Tess. I would, uh, the point of emphasis is I, I know that we've talked about the economic and job impact for those dollars and I would anticipate that we'll, that the office would be certainly well prepared as we go into this legislative session to educate those who are interested as to the value of those dollars. So I, uh, I, I hear what you're saying and, and, uh, and certainly agree. Are there questions or comments? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Chair Dombrowski, this is Casey. Um, I, I just had maybe an administrative request of, of Ochi just uh, I think Tyler did a great job of kind of walking through the governor's budget, but if you could make sure that each of the board uh, members get a link to the actual budget. I know it's hundreds of pages long, but um, I think that would be good for us to, to be able to review, um, knowing that there, there, there may be adjustments in the future, but if we get access to that, that would be great. Yeah. I'm not hearing any other comments or questions. Um, you know what? I, I might just follow up on, on Regent Tess's question earlier, and that is sort of where do we go from here? Um, that's a very valid question, and one that's interesting as we transition from one administrative team to the next. Uh, the information Tyler gave you is exactly right. The current governor has until the 15th to uh, produce what we often refer to as the, the budget book. Um, incoming administration has till the 7th. But then, you know, I think it's also worth noting there's no obligation by the legislature to start with either of those. Hmm. Um, they can make whatever adjustments they want through global amendments. Uh, it, it is the process and you know, it's, it's, it's as good as we got. It's, it's a two year process that really starts 
uh, for us at every campus around the MUS. And then those budgets are rolled up uh, into sides and into our, our budget requests that then go through a process that's happened all summer long, turning our budget requests into what the, the current governor is willing to put into the budget from present law adjustments to the M ready to you name it, they all ultimately have discretion. Um, so there, there's a lot of moving pieces and I, I think we shouldn't lose sight of that as we approach this next session. And, uh, you know, it, it's a starting point for us. It's a request for us. It, it shouldn't be construed a lot beyond that. And, and then I think we'll try to work with uh, the incoming administration and, and certainly the legislature to tell our story of uh, why these resources are needed. You know, there's interesting, how do you get to present law adjustments? I mean, foundationally, by definition, it's sort of what resources we need to do uh, the next two years, what we're doing now. But that's an interesting proposition because it's, it, it's also not a static or a status quo number. We have through promotion, tenure, merit pay, uh, annualized pay plans, we have obligations that we're already candidly contractually obligated to. Um, so not getting some of those present law adjustments really would put us at a deficit because those are monies that, that will need to be spent uh, as we move forward and, and of course, the cost uh, to our campuses for other services from electrical to resources to libraries, you name it, um, those tend to move as well. And so uh, part of it is trying to anticipate what those inflationary costs would be, but another part of it is truly just calculating what our costs will be. And that in terms of annualizing the pay plan, which still makes up 80% of our budget and some of those uh, costs that are already certain for us moving forward. So it's not a, it, it's not a wish list. Um, it's not a anticipation of, it, it would be nice if we could, it, it really is our cost of doing business as we move forward. And that's the story that we'll tell to the legislative subcommittee and, and all that'll listen and, and we'll work to uh, try to retain those resources as, as we move forward. Um, but it, it certainly can and will likely move through a number of iterations. So I think we just have to sort of uh, brace for that and not overreact to that. It's, uh, it's part of the budget process. Um, it's worked for 120 some years in Montana and it's going to continue to work. It may not be easy every day, but it, uh, We'll get to the end of it, and and we've got a good story to tell, and and we'll work we'll work with uh, both the incoming administration and the incoming uh, legislature to try uh, to work through the process. Thank you, Commissioner Kirshner. That was that was helpful. And Madam Chair, I, please. I think earlier, perhaps Regent Nystuen raised his hand. I'm not sure if he had any oh. questions or comments. No, no, exactly. I, I was going to ask the exact same question Paul did. And so uh, you did a great job at answering it uh, for Paul. And then the additional color from, from uh, Commissioner Christian was very helpful too. So thank you. Thank you, Chair Lozar, for uh, acknowledging that. Are there any other questions or comments on information A, Governor's budget? Regent Sexton? Um, thank you. No, I'm not hearing you. I don't know if it's me or... There you go. should be good. Okay. There thank you, go. you, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge how difficult it is in the world of COVID and everything that is constantly changing to make a budget for the next two years. So I wanted to thank um, all the campuses and Deputy Commissioner Trevor and his team for all their really hard work and efforts to estimate that during this time. Thank you. Questions or comments? Uh, if no further, we'll move to information B, uh, which is the Dawson Community College enrollment update and plan. Um, that is a, a an item that uh, 
that we have to include uh, relative to an enrollment plan commitment in the past. And um, I'm not sure if, um, trying to look at my participant list to see if uh, someone from Dawson, will, oh, there you are, would like to speak to that uh, report briefly. Oh, yes, I need to look here. Good afternoon and hello from Dawson Community College. Uh, Madam Chair, my name is Leila Cheda and I am the Vice President of Academic and Student Affairs here. Um, due to COVID related delays, uh, this is season stadium enrollment on census day was lower than 200 FE, hence the reason why we are um, providing this document. However, I'm very happy to share that our, uh, just a few days later after census day, our enrollment went back up to 208 FTE. And our projected end of term FTE shows that we have sustained a state, the same in state enrollment as fall 2019. So we're very uh, proud for that. Also, DCC is proud to share that our overall enrollment uh, has increased by 6% from last fall to this fall. Uh, in front of you, you have a report uh, from us. And with that, I will uh, answer any questions you might have. Terrific, thank you very much. Uh, I, I was stretching to find the 193 on the report. So um, good to know that the final number was in fact over 200. Are there questions or comments? All right, I see none. Uh, so with that, that adjourns the business of the Budget and Audit Committee. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and that officially sets a record for the shortest budget uh, admin and audit committee of all time, um, although a very effective meeting. Um, I, if you look at the agenda, um, we are at the end of the agenda uh, today. We had um, actually planned for an hour and 10 minute break <laughs> on accident. Um, and so we'll, we'll buy back some time and I'm gonna buy back a little time uh, by reminding Regent Sheehy of the time uh, a couple years ago in, in Bozeman where she wasn't able to make uh, the, the budget committee meeting at, that or the ARSA committee meeting that she was chairing and she asked me to chair it. And she showed up to the meeting about three hours or so after the ARSA committee meeting was supposed to be concluded and I was still running the meeting. So I just want, this is just a heads up, Regent Sheehy, that I'm buying back that time now uh, with an additional two hours <laughs> on the agenda. That's uh, carbon offsets. It's carbon offsets. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, 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 I'd like for us actually, um, just knowing how much time and um, care uh, go, went into the virtual campus tour uh, for the University of Montana. I, I did wanna take, before we go into public comment, take the time for, for us all to enjoy the virtual Usually. campus tour. The University of Montana is routinely ranked as one of the most pristine college campuses in the world. Tucked away at the base of Mount Sentinel and along the Clark Fork River, UM is a destination for students from across the country and the world. Here at UM, we put students at the center of all that we do, and that means a renewed commitment to investing in our campus facilities to maximize learning opportunities and ensure that our students experience best in-class facilities. This summer, we began executing our plan to invest over $100 million into the University of Montana campus facilities, including our affiliate campuses. This funding was created after we executed a complete modernization and restructure of virtually all of the University of Montana affiliation's outstanding debt. While we've made some tremendous and impactful investments over the past year, the most significant improvements are yet to come. In the next few years, our students and our community will witness a transformation of many key infrastructure, learning, living, and dining spaces at UM. One of the most visible improvements we made this summer was replacing the brickwork on our iconic oval, the centerpiece and heart of our campus. This was the first time in more than 50 years that structural improvements had been made to restore and preserve the oval's grandeur. 
After removing cracked and uneven brick walkways, we installed easily maintained dyed and stamped concrete pathways with a design that pays honor to our past and equips us for the future. As a result, all of our students, faculty, staff, and visitors will cross the oval safely as they explore all that UM has to offer. The URI Lecture Hall is the largest and most heavily used shared learning space on the UM campus. Throughout the day, students attend classes in the URI Lecture Hall for biology, history, math, and nearly every other discipline that UM offers. URI Lecture Hall also serves as the centerpiece for student orientation. With new flooring, seats, acoustics, lighting, and video systems, URI Lecture Hall now provides our community with a state-of-the-art learning center that will serve our campus for many years to come. The food is fantastic. That's what I hear from UM students every time I ask their opinion of our food zoo. Unfortunately, the current dining facility doesn't reflect the quality of food produced by our colleagues at UM Dining Services. Oh, maybe, maybe some higher ceilings. Uh, there's not a lot of, you know, airflow. Definitely get, you know, it gets a little drafty. Uh, maybe some more like natural lighting, a lot more windows. Like right now it kind of feels like we're underground. You can't really like see outside or anything. It feels kind of oppressing, you know? It would be really nice to have like windows with some light. I think that would kind of like improve the atmosphere. And that's one of the reasons we're planning for the construction of a new, modern, state-of-the-art dining facility that will not only ensure our facilities are on par with the outstanding meals that are being served to our thousands of students each day, but will also serve as a destination location for our community, with a stunning view of our Rudy audio sculpture of UM's mascot and the Oval. The University of Montana is committed to energy efficiency, conservation, and reducing our impact on the environment by reducing our carbon footprint. That's why we're planning an investment of up to $20 million to replace UM's 1960s era natural gas powered steam plant that serves to heat the majority of our campus buildings. By replacing this old equipment and adding turbines that will both generate electricity and provide heat to the campus, we anticipate reducing our scope one and two emissions by approximately 30%. This investment will result in the most significant reduction in these emissions in UM's history larger than all of our previous energy conservation efforts combined. In addition to anticipated emissions reductions, we expect that energy cost savings could be as much as $1.7 million annually. UM's music building is not just home to some of our most dedicated and creative students. It also serves as a regional hub for the growing music scene in Western Montana. Without any major structural improvements in nearly 70 years, this building is in dire need for critical upgrades. The impression of the building is really demotivating for students. We have such an incredible faculty. We don't have a building that really reflects the value of our programs at all. Soundproofing rooms is a very standard, it is the standard for any music building today on any campus, um, regardless of the quality of the program. And none of our rooms are soundproof, not a single one. The practice rooms, the the size of them are so small, and with, with the lack of sound absorption, some instruments you play there damage their own hearing practicing in those rooms. The classrooms, you can hear the people practicing from beneath, so, you know, if I'm taking an exam, I can hear the two bits below me practicing for their jury. And we have a lot of holes in the ceilings, a lot of water damage. The lockers, I would say only about 75% of them work at all. Um, a lot of them are really hard to open. Another one of the most pressing issues is we don't have any sort of student lounge. The music building has a fantastic culture. The students here get to really know each other like a family, but they have nowhere to congregate in this building. We don't have a single table in this building where a student can go and just sit down and do homework or eat. In a not COVID world, students are lining these hallways, sitting on the floor to do homework and eat. Everyone loves what they're doing here. They just, they hate the building. They can't work in this building. A modest investment from the state will help secure additional private support to remodel this important building and provide our award-winning music students a facility that matches the level of their commitment and talent. The University of Montana's Frankie College of Forestry and Conservation is world-renowned and is home to the nation's number one ranked wildlife biology program. Its graduates are proven global leaders on natural resource management. This world-class college is currently housed in a building that is over 100 years old. Our forestry and conservation students and faculty occupy space in 11 buildings across UM's campus, a result of program growth without commensurate expansion of dedicated space. 
Additionally, our chemistry, biology, and science students are learning in and conducting groundbreaking research in aging labs across campus that aren't fitted with the latest technology and modern safety standards. Some of the chemistry labs, like the teaching labs for freshmen and sophomores, is a little underwhelming. <laughs> Especially in this time right now, it's really important to invest in our young scientists and STEM students and to encourage those students to be excited about where they're working and having the materials they need to be successful. I think everybody likes to see shiny new equipment and um, materials that gets them excited to work. Constructing a new forestry, conservation, and lab science complex will provide these students with the facility they deserve, while also creating new critical high-tech lab spaces for the growing number of students who are enrolling in science majors at the University of Montana. When completed, this new facility will be a major attraction for students across the globe. The University of Montana is in a unique position to grow and expand over the next decade. With some critical infrastructure upgrades, the University of Montana's students and faculty can build on the progress we have made. We are already seeing previous investments pay dividends across campus, and we remain committed to making the improvements needed to prepare the next generation of leaders right here at the University of Montana. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you to the University of Montana for taking the time to, uh, to put together that video. Obviously, uh, the video really matched the, the energy and the excitement from President Bodner's presentation this morning to what the campus will look like in, in the near future. And it's really exciting to see the, um, the, the design and the, and the layout of some of the new improvements or making sure that there's student voice um, embedded in what the needs are and what the look will be for each of the big projects that University of Montana has prioritized. So kudos to the University of Montana. Again, I wish we were there uh, on campus uh, viewing the, the improvements. Uh, with that, uh, before we move on to public comment, um, uh, Superintendent Arntzen has uh, joined us. Uh, we'll pass it over to you, Superintendent, for your remarks. Thank you very much. I appreciate, can you hear me? We're good? Excellent, like the thumbs up. I think in Zoom world, that's where we are. So uh, Regents, Commissioner, good afternoon. I wish that we could all be together around the table at the University of Montana. My alumni as well, myself sitting next to the president. I wish everyone well. Um, wanting everyone to go back to normal, huh? I, I, I know, I normally do a barbecue this time of year for our agency, and it's the Brawl of the Wild barbecue where uh, we wear our jerseys for either University of Montana or for that other one that's a little bit further east. And um, it's, a, it's a good time for social, but it's also a great time to bring us together that we're Montanans. So thank you very much for just a few minutes to be able to share what's going on in K-12 world. Um, big, huge uh, embracing of our families as well as our families in education at this point. Our schools are in and out of um, the classroom right now because of the virus and the responsibility that is on a teacher at this point, that is on a school administrator, but more importantly on that mom and dad that are trying to work as their children are maybe in school or may not be, like my granddaughters, Harper and Piper, who because of a classroom incident are now two, wor two weeks uh, remote learning. And, and that's first grade and fourth grade. So you can imagine how that hits all the way across K-12. But our families in Montana are resilient. I'd like to leave with that positive. So just some uh, really interesting things at this point. We have uh, received from the Board of Public Education as of uh, the fifth of this month, the opportunity to open up two chapters, really three, but two are the most important at this point. Uh, this is the accreditation chapter. This is chapter 55 that are their rules. 
And accreditation means what is the accountability system look like for a quality education? So it's been uh, some time since those have been dusted off and looked at. I know we'll be seeking input, public input, and of course, from our partners in post-secondary. The other chapter that we're looking at is licensing. And of course, this is with the Council of Deans um, that are housed on our campuses, but to make sure that we deliver the, the best quality education to those pre-service teachers so that we can have fabulous in-service teachers as they uh, get their license from, um, from the state of Montana. And we are, we are very excited that we'll be opening this up. We have quite a long timeline. So uh, these may not be completed until 22. One will not be done until 23. But it's forward thinking to make sure that we can have great Montana comment on what a quality system of K-12 looks like. So we'll be asking for membership on our committees from um, you and from your experts that you know. The other thing that we have that, of course, we have new leadership. The legislature had their caucus as of most recently yesterday. Just to share with you, my number one priority is to make sure that we have our base aid, that promise from the legislature and the general fund delivered to our 150,000 public school children. And that base aid I'm asking for is also an inflationary component for special education. And quite frankly, the governor and I agree on everything but that inflationary component on special education. So when his, when his budget came out and my budget is there as well, we agree very, very similar. And by the similarity, it's a $2 million each year of the biennium, that's a difference. So to support our special needs students and our students that are in um, treatment programs across our state that are our most at risk students, we wanna make sure that the legislature, that it's a promise to a promise. I have witnessed when I was a legislator, I have witnessed when I've been in my role now, this will be my third session, that if we don't support from the state, then it becomes an impact at that local taxpayer. And this impact for special needs sometimes can be very, very challenging. So to have the state support this means then that that local control model can be held whole and we can support our local taxpayers so that we don't have large incidents that will harm those local school budgets. So my legislative proposal is to make sure that we have base aid and we support our special education students and those that are in in-state treatment. I also have a, a new um, amendment from our state plan, uh, Every Student Succeed Act that Congress passed uh, in 16 to make sure that I've got an opportunity for our small schools to be able to exit from comprehensive or targeted support which means then that that um, understanding that if they're a very small rural school, one size doesn't fit all. And we received a waiver when we submitted the plan from the federal government, and now we have to complete that. And our time frame is to have this given to um, the Department of Education before the end of the year. With that, it's on our website. I would encourage anyone to go onto the OPI website and please search out ESSA. You'll see where that small school um, amendment process is. If you have any comments, please, uh, we need to make sure that those get in before we deliver them. The other thing that we have um, is, I'm so excited that uh, we received some waivers and not just about nutrition because we need to make sure that all children have that very basic need first before they move forward. But we also received a waiver in 21st century. 21st century means that there's a partnership before school and after school and that school is in the middle. This waiver wasn't on dollars, but it was on flexibilities to allow learning to continue in and out of COVID. So when I remarked about our champions that we have across Montana, for parents to be able to go to work, 
and to supply things that our economy needs at this point, to grow back our economy, we need to make sure that they are embraced with before and after school programs. I have about 90 of them across our state that are now being able to have more flexibility in how they offer education programs, nutrition programs as well. You and I all both know, so people that are here, we know we can't do it all by ourselves. I need our partnership in post-secondary. I need our partnerships in our communities across our state in before school and after school programs to embrace our children, whoever they are, wherever they might be. Um, also wanted to share that we have a received a $9 million grant uh, from SAMHSA. This is from the Federal Health and Human Services. And it is about mental health and resiliency. $9 million doesn't seem like much when we spread it across our 400 school districts. But I know that you also embrace the fact that suicide ideation is something that we must work harder at in our partnerships across our state and allowing this grant to flow from the federal government into the OPI is going to be exceedingly important. The other thing regarding health and mental health is part of this. We received a grant with the Montana Healthcare Foundation and it's a seed, it's very small, but we're gonna grow this so that we can have health on our campuses. A shout out to all of our school nurses, but we don't have a lot of school nurses that are there that can help in everything and in mental health specifically. So having our health, Montana Healthcare Foundation aid Montana's public school system in seeding healthcare in our schools will not only help our children be healthier, our families be healthier, but as we know, our, in our rural communities, schools, they are the heart of our community. So to have a healthy community going forward is what this seed grant is about. I'm also very proud that within all the work that the OPI has done, in uh, the five um, teaching and learning standards that we have here at the OPI that we have, we have refurbished. I have 12, we have done five. One of them I wanna shout out, and because it was Veterans Day just a week ago, how important it is to understand the uh, impact of civics education. My father was an American history teacher and to shout out a partnership with the American Legion right now, they took on an initiative to allow our partnership to put stars and stripes and to have the pledge and the constitutions in all of our classrooms across our state. This has gone nationally as well. And so the Montana American Legion has gotten national uh, recognition that we are impacting civics education. And it was just rolled out um, on Remembrance Day, which of course is 9-11 of this year. So we have five years in statutes to have different curriculum, different type of professional development for teachers. I know I'll be seeking to you in post-secondary on how we can impact um, our K-12 education by growing civics education within all of our classrooms across our state. So with that, Thanksgiving is upon us. And we need to be thankful for our partnership. I keep saying those words, but I'm, I'm meaningful with that. It is a meaningful uh, relationship that we have built. And we're gonna continue that in the next four years um, and beyond that. Because again, I'm gonna come back. Individually, we are strong, but together we are even more so. So with that, um, Mr. Chair, I will stand for questions. And I so appreciate you giving me this precious time. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Artson. Are there any questions for members of the board? Any comments? I don't see any questions or comments. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Superintendent Artson. I just wanted to also thank uh, all the high schools that participated in uh, yes. College App Week with 8,100 uh, completed applications. So. Thank you. Uh, please extend our, our gratitude to those, those high schools that participated. 
And with that, I think we are moving to the last item in the agenda uh, for this afternoon, uh, where we will be taking public comment. Um, Amy, if you could just walk us through how this will work on the virtual platform. Certainly, thank you, Chair Lozar. As you noted, this meeting is indeed open to the public electronically. Anyone wishing to provide public comment is certainly encouraged to do so. For those joining by phone, uh, please, I'm sorry, for those joining, please do dial 1253-215-8782 and enter the meeting ID as shown on the live stream feed. Please press the star nine number to raise your hand. For those of us joined on Zoom, please raise your hand, use the raise your hand feature found in the participants panel to indicate that you wish to give public comment. The host will lower hands in order and unmute the phone line to ask the individual their full name and allow them to give public comment. Comments can also be submitted in writing via email to myself at aunsworth at montana.edu. Comments received will be shared with board members and included as part of the official record. And I'll just give it a minute here to, to let anybody join as needed. And again, that, that information to join that via the phone is being displayed on the screen to anyone watching. Good. With that, um, is there any public comment? I think while Amy is, uh, is was checking to see if there's any public comment. I know we have received uh, some written public comment uh, over the, uh, the course of the last couple of weeks um, uh, that are inputted on the record. So is there any public comment? We'll give folks a, another minute or so to try to log on. Chair, it's worth mentioning too, because we've received comments over the summer and other things. So, um, anyone that wants to submit additional written public comment is certainly free to do so after the meeting. If they could, please mark it as public comment for the Regents meeting, the November Regents meeting. And so it gets sort of attached to the right area of our records and then it'll be made a permanent part of the records. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Is there any public comment? No, Chair, there's not. Uh, not seeing any public comment, uh, I, I guess I would uh, just note tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's agenda, uh, we will be reconvening the meeting at, at eight o'clock. Um, and uh, we will work through the Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee and the two-year and Community College Committee. We have got a pretty busy uh, couple of committee meetings in the morning. Um, but for those uh, in the public, uh, a reminder, um, I know we are a little bit ahead right now. So if you were anticipating public comment today at 4.45, um, you will have another opportunity to provide public comment tomorrow morning, roughly around 11 or so, um, give or take, uh, depending on, on how the meeting is progressing. So that will be around 11 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, with that, um, thank you for a great afternoon, members of the board, and we will reconvene tomorrow morning.